Hi, good morning. If you could take your seats. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the 19th Annual Wall Street Comes to Washington Conference. And I'm Paul Ginsburg, now of the University of Southern California, um, Director of Health Policy at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. And almost 20 years ago, shortly after I became president of the Center for Studying Health System Change, I realized there was an information gap between the world of policymakers inside the Beltway and the world of equity and bond analysts on Wall Street. The Wall Street Comes to Washington conference was created to help bridge that gap. And I'm delighted that the Jane Koskinas Ted Giovannis Foundation for Health and Policy recognized the value of this conference by sponsoring it for the second year. Through research and projects like this conference, the JKTG Foundation hopes to foster discussion about cost reduction, expanding access to care, and improving quality. As I've already said, the purpose is to give Washington Health Policy community insights into market developments that are relevant to policy through a different source of information, specifically the equity and bond analysts. And equity analysts advise investors about which publicly traded companies will do well, which ones will not, and bond analysts advise on the likelihood of debt repayments. And along with a thorough understanding of healthcare markets and the companies they follow, good analysts closely follow public policy, which often has important implications for these companies. So this is an opportunity for the equity and bond analysts to take a break from assessing the outlook for profitability or solvency of companies and bring their understanding of market forces to bear on key health policy questions. And our format this morning, as it's always been, will be a roundtable discussion based on a series of questions that have been shared with the panelists in advance. And we'll have two opportunities for audience question, uh, questions. Uh, the first before we take a break at 10.30, and the second before we adjourn at noon. And there are blue question cards in your pocket, and please fill them out and give them to a conference staff member. Or if you want to make sure your question is answered or asked properly, uh, you can use a microphone to ask the question. Note that the analysts are not permitted by their employers to answer questions about the outlook for specific companies. And again, I want to thank the Jane Koskinas Ted Giovannis Foundation for Health and Policy for sponsoring the conference. A transcript and webcast of this conference will be posted on the foundation website next week. And before you leave today, we'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to fill out the evaluation. It's on the yellow paper inside your packet and leave it on the table outside the meeting room. We have a terrific panel this morning. Some are veterans of previous Wall Street Comes to Washington conferences. Uh, that's Carl McDonald of City Investment Research and Jim Labune of Fitch Ratings. Unfortunately, Cheryl Skolnick was unable to attend at the last minute because of an emergency situation, and she graciously recommended her former colleague, Nick Leventis, to step in. Nick started covering healthcare services in 2008 uh, when he first uh, went to work for, on Wall Street for CRT Capital Group LLC, which is Cheryl's firm Cheryl was with. And he has worked on both the sell side and the buy side. He's currently working as a private investor managing his own capital. And we're delighted to welcome another new panelist, Ralph Jacoby of Credit Suisse. So let's get right into the discussion. Uh, let me give you just a brief context. A year ago, uh, the context was uncertainty about the functioning of federal and state exchanges, especially in light of cancellation of individual insurance policies that did not meet ACA standards political reactions to the sticker shock from community rating approaches, and higher standards for health insurance plans, and the degree of adverse selection by individuals opting into the exchanges. I wrote a whole thing about the context this year, but I decided you don't want to hear any more from me. You want to hear from these people. So let me jump right in, and I'm going to be uh, rotating the questions between insurance market questions and provider market questions. And I'm going to start by asking analysts, uh, uh, what's your outlook on enrollment 
uh, through the uh, ACA exchanges in 2015 and 2016. Carl, you want to start? Sure. Um, great. Uh, so on the uh, exchange uh, enrollment outlook, uh, we actually just did a, a survey of our institutional clients uh, back in October. Uh, so it was roughly 100 investors, and um, the conclusion from that was uh, an increase of between 4 uh, to 4.2 million people in, in 2015. Um, so that would bring the overall enrollment, at least based on those historical HHS enrollment numbers, to something over 11 million. Um, of that 4 to 4.2, uh, the expectation was roughly 2.5 million of those would be previously uninsured. Uh, you know, relative to the, uh, the HHS projection of 9 to 9.9 .9 million, uh, I'm more optimistic than that. I think, uh, you know, a couple of things that they may not be factoring in. So one is that I think we have seen small group dumping in 2014 into exchanges. Uh, I think that will increase uh, in, in 2015. Uh, there's certain one-off situations. So as an example, there's something like 300,000 lives in Massachusetts uh, that will be I think they're technically qualified as Medicaid today that will be moved into exchanges next year. Um, and then the last point uh, would be either certain states or certain health plans are no longer going to allow people in non-compliant plans to stay that way in 2015. So similar to last year, you will have some plan cancellations and people that will have to move uh, you know, from those non-compliant plans, you know, and some portion of those will end up in an exchange policy. And maybe just to just to add to that, um, so I would echo uh, a lot of Carl's comments. Um, we also expect to have a pretty sort of robust uh, 2015 over 14. Uh, again, with the botch rollout early in the year, um, I think a lot of a lot of companies were uh, you know, pulled back a bit in terms of even outreach efforts to uh, to individuals, and we're certainly see hearing it across the publicly traded space. A lot more sort of a aggressive tactics, if you will, or outreach efforts um, to try to get more people enrolled, which, you know, we would think would uh, would certainly help. We, we haven't had any glitches to this point um, within the uh, the healthcare.gov site, obviously, um, or certainly more minimal than, than what we had last year. So, you know, I think those factors certainly play into why there, there could be. Um, and then to Carl's point as well, you know, th there's sort of the two elements of this, which is the, n the previously uninsured piece and sort of the um, the dumping piece or, or the change of previously insured moving on to the exchanges. So um, I think for most estimates, we, we all look at the, the headline number. Uh, for some, on the provider side, you know, the important question is more of what was previously uninsured gaining coverage. So, you know, to the extent that we get more clarity on that, I think that's going to be an important topic for uh, for all of us that we're looking out for going into, uh, into 2015. Any sense about uh, the, the demographic mix of people who are enrolling and the effect that the individual mandate's been having? So, so I would say the individual mandate probably hasn't had much of an effect. Um, yeah, I think there's a learning curve here when, when you start thinking about, uh, you know, individuals and understanding what the ramifications are of not having it. Uh, you know, so year one was that $95 penalty and or, you know, uh, the greater of $95 or 1% of income above a, a tax threshold limit. So uh, no one's really had to face that. And when, when you go do your taxes this year, um, you know, that there, there are some that are going to get be hit with with sort of some incremental dollar, the question is, you know, once they learn that, you know, this year, does it really help this open enrollment season or are we really going to start facing it in 20, uh, for 2016? The penalties do increase, as some of you probably know, from that 95 up to 325 uh, in year two and or 2% of income, again, above a, a, a tax threshold. So um, do I think it's really had a meaningful impact in year one? No. Do I think it will have a meaningful, more meaningful impact in sort of years two and three? Yes, um, which is another reason why we should get, you know, more people coming onto the exchanges. In terms of the demographic mix, um, I, I think it's, you know, more, more logical than, than anything else that, you know, year one probably had um, an older, sicker population joining. Uh, remains to be seen uh, in year two exactly who comes on, but I think just um, almost by definition, you'd have to expect that it would be some level of younger, healthier, certainly relative to year one. And I would just say from a, from a demographic perspective, um, so the, the analysis that I had done is that at the end of open enrollment, average age of the exchange population was about 41. Um, compare that to the average age of the uninsured population, which is closer to 30 or 31. So it's about 10 years older um, on the exchange. 
most of the insurers had assumed that it would be an older mix, uh, but the vast majority of them did not assume it was going to be 10 years older, which is why so many of them have uh, ended up losing money this year. Um, I think relative to that uh, average age, and you know, caveat here is average age does not necessarily equal health status, but sort of the best uh, measure that we have. Um, since the end of open enrollment, it's likely that that um, health status has deteriorated. So if you think about the HHS enrollment, at one point it was 8 million, it's now down to 6.7. Uh, those people that uh, are falling off the rolls are presumably not sick people that are in the hospital every day. Um, you know, it's people that uh, you know, either didn't find a value or didn't think they were going to uh, use the services. Uh, as a more recent data point, uh, WellPoint's individual enrollment in the third quarter was down about 5% uh, to give you a sense of uh, you know, what the attrition rate has looked like um, past open enrollment. Uh, in terms of next year, don't have a lot of data points, but uh, you know, one is HealthNet out in California. Their assumption is that the people coming on in 2015 uh, are going to be about 15% better from a health status, so morbidity, uh, you know, 15% better next year. Uh, and it's been interesting um, the uh, the reaction from the health insurers uh, to that uh, HHS enrollment number. You know, the HHS enrollment number obviously substantially lower than CBO. Uh, some of the insurers basically said, we don't care. We priced based on our book of business this year. We weren't assuming an improvement in the market next year. Whereas some of the insurers uh, were much more concerned about their pricing next year if they'd factored in a big improvement in the pool. Uh, and so if the overall enrollment doesn't grow uh, as much as the CBO expected, that potentially will put some pressure on the, uh, on the earnings. Mm -hmm. Good point. Let me skip down to... If Republicans are able to cut off funding for the risk corridors, um, you know what, what type of an impact, how large an impact would this have on exchange products? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it would be a significant impact overall. Um, so did an analysis as of uh, mid-year June 30th to try to project what the risk corridor amount was. Uh, my assumption was across the industry, plans are assuming receivables that they're going to get $1 billion, give or take, in risk order payments this year. Uh, the problem is that across at least the plans that I looked at, there was one single one that was assuming that they were going to pay into the risk order program. So if you have one going in that thinks they're going to pay a couple million and all the rest thinking the money's coming out and it's going to be a billion dollars, uh, the only way that is going to happen is either if HHS can come up with the funding in their budget or they get an appropriation from Congress. Uh, given the makeup of Congress right now, the chances of an appropriation are zero. Um, <laughs> so, you know, unless HHS can come up with it in the budget, it's going to have to be rolled over uh, to the following year. Uh, you know, so to, to, to put that in context, um, the individual business uh, this year is probably, uh, it's certainly north of $50 billion uh, in revenue. So, you know, a billion dollars is a, uh, you know, a significant chunk and, and would have a uh, material impact on pricing if uh, the plans had known that it wasn't going to come. The, the only thing I guess I'd, I'd add to that is, um, you know, a lot of this comes down to timing on when when it would be cut off um, to the extent that it's cut off sooner. Obviously, it's, it's more of an issue to Carl's point to the extent that, you know, it, it doesn't and it's just sort of rhetoric, if you will, or, um, you know, headlines. You know, the, the risk quarter program goes away in three years, so we're already sort of down, you know, sort of one year. So obviously there's receivables built up. It, it sort of matters of whether or not that gets funded to this point and then sort of going forward it gets cut off. Um, so this is a little bit of a timing element to this as well. Um, you know, just as it relates to whether or not it's going to uh, to be, you know, defunded because ultimately this program goes away in three years anyway. Yeah. I think a big issue for a policy maker would be what happens in 20, for 2016 rates. In a sense, does this really affect how the insurance price for 2016? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I should have clarified. Yes, absolutely. So to the extent that it goes away, it's going to be a big issue for, for managed care because clearly that was one level of assumption in year two. It's hard to price without having some having made some assumption around, you know, any of the, all of the three R's essentially in year two, maybe not as aggressive as you were in year one because ultimately, again, you know, aside from uh, the risk adjuster payment, you know, the other two are going away. So you would seemingly believe 
that as you move through each year, um, you know, the pricing is going to better reflect a more sort of normalized rate on a go-forward basis without the reliance of two of the three R's. Yeah, and just from a, from a pricing perspective, so if you think about, you know, a billion dollars on, and I'm making this number up, but let's just say individual premiums are 50 billion, um, you know, that would give you a sense of what the, the rate increase would look like. Um, I wouldn't expect to see uh, that much of, a, of an increase in 2016, though, just because you are going to have some plans, even today, who would say, look, we're not going to get a penny from the risk order program. So we're not putting it into our 2014 pricing. We're not putting it into our 2015 pricing. So some of that is already um, reflected in the, uh, in, in the race that the plans have put out there. Sure. Good. And do you see any uh, impacts of the Supreme Court's taking up the King versus Burwell? on insurance companies, you know, between now and June, well, before the decision comes out? Or are they just going to wait and see? Sure, Nick. Sure. sure. Uh, so, kind of, in my conversations with providers and plans, it seems like everybody's operating under the status quo that, you know, whatever happens is somewhat irrelevant. Um, you know, I think the media is making a big deal out of this, but CMS can easily give some type of waiver or agreement to the states that would allow them to essentially shift the, the um, state from being a, a federally run exchange to a state-based exchange. So I don't think anybody's really concerned about that. I think the, the media is making it into a very large deal just because of the election and whatnot. But my talk, uh, my talking to the providers and the, and the payers, I don't uh, see anybody acting. Uh, uh, irrationally or worried about it. And I guess I would, so I'd add to that from the, from the insurer perspective, I think what, what they're focused on, so they are assuming that everything will stay the same, uh, that there won't be any significant changes, but I think the things that they're thinking about, so uh, one is around the timing. So let's just say Supreme Court rules that it's unconstitutional and subsidies end immediately. Um, you know, one thing the insurers want to do is uh, make sure you hold consumers harmless. So they didn't do anything wrong. So make sure that when they file their tax return for the next year, those premium credits that they got either for the first half or the full year, that they don't have to give those back. Um, yeah, so I think that's one thing they're doing. Uh, second thing is around reinsurance and um, deductibles. So the reinsurance, you only get the reinsurance benefit when claims this year exceed $45,000. If you're only gonna have the people for half the year, you're going to have far fewer people that are going to reach that $45,000 threshold. Um, you know, so that's a consideration. Uh, third is just from a consumer perspective, deductibles. So you start in your exchange plan, you pay your $5,000 or $3,000, whatever the deductible is, and then let's say it gets cut off at mid-year. If you switch to a new plan at that point, you start up with a new deductible. Um, so you know, is there a way to uh, you know, try to mitigate that? Um, they're also sharing workaround plans with the states. Uh, so as Nick said, it's very easy for a state to just sign a document saying, we're outsourcing the running of our exchange to the federal government. It's now a state-based exchange. We're outsourcing it to the federal government. The problem that you have is that the governors and the legislature that you need to sign those documents, uh, it's highly unlikely in some states that they would be willing to do anything uh, to help health reform. Uh, so in that scenario where it goes away entirely, uh, the exchange markets, if there was no subsidies, it would just cease to function. Um, you know, plans would pull out of the uh, exchange because you would still have guaranteed issue. You'd still have to offer the product to everybody, but you wouldn't have, uh, you know, subsidies and, you know, very few people would be buying except those that were, were sick. So it, it would essentially turn it into a high-risk pool that the, uh, you know, insurers wouldn't have a lot of interest in, in serving. Good. Oh, go ahead, no, I was just going to say that, that that would be the more more interesting aspect of this is if it goes against the administration, you know, whether you really do have sort of the Republican governors uh, sort of not extend or not look for ways to, uh, to extend, um, you know, insurance. It, it, it's sort of easy to say from a governor's perspective, in, in our opinion at least, um, you know, we, we're not willing to expand Medicaid, so we never gave insurance to anybody to, to begin with, so we're not pulling anything away per se, so no one's had the benefit. I think it's a whole other debate and argument when you've had people that are utilizing services that have subsidies, and for a governor now to actually 
take that away. So I think that's going to be one of the more interesting characteristics. And I, I just think it's going to be, again, maybe I'm using too much logic here over politics, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I just think it's going to be very difficult for that to, uh, to happen. So you know, we continue to believe that whether it's you know, in favor of the administration or against the administration that um, you know, things are going, this is not going to derail the ACA in our opinion. Okay. I think there's a, a lot of attention on uh, Arkansas right now from, from some of those Republican governors. So uh, Arkansas did a Medicaid expansion uh, through the exchange, um, and you've had a, uh, a turnover in the, uh, the leadership in the state. So there's an ongoing debate right now about whether that's going to get extended or killed. Um, so to the extent that program ends and you have a situation where you did give coverage to people and now you're taking it away, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in seeing what the political reaction to that is uh, you know, as a uh, indicator for what could potentially happen in some of the other uh, Republican states. Good. Well, this is a good transition to Medicaid uh, because I've got a question about, you know, if you look at the waivers granted to Arkansas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, some other states, uh, what does it tell you as far as potential future changes in the direction of the Medicaid program? You know, if we're start talking about 2017 with, um, you know, new leadership, whether it's Republican president or Democratic president, uh, you know, having a different perspective on Medicaid from having gone through the process of negotiating these waivers. So uh, any of you have a sense in your crystal ball about, uh, you know, broad directions in Medicaid? My sense is, is that you're going to see Medicaid expansion with the waivers and, and with some of the changes in, in uh, some of the state house and some of the legislatures, I think it's you're going to see an expansion as long as it can be done on a on Republican terms. I think CMS understanding the administration, understanding the change in Washington, I think that they've shown an, a willingness to to look at some some um, some different plans. Uh, and, and granting those waivers, and I think given the political reality in Washington or, or within the country, I think that they're going to be more willing to, to look at different alternatives to expanding that Medicaid coverage. But I think, you know, going forward, um, there's a lot of political pressure within those states to, to provide that coverage. So I think you will see an expansion, but it'll be done under, you know, um, uh, sort of a uh, increase in the waiver programs that are granted. I'd also piggyback on that comment and just say that having watched um, the Arkansas model as it was coming about, um, it seems from my perspective that HHS is willing to bend over backwards um, and let the states, if they can pass any type of Medicaid expansion, they will take it in whatever form or fashion they can get. I don't see that changing anytime soon, and I think especially the states that are kind of on the fence, like Tennessee, um, which is also funny because it's uh, one of the largest states for health care of all the uh, providers being located there, except for one on the publicly traded side. Um, I, I think they're, they're for the, the rest of the states who have not expanded, it's definitely going to be through a waiver program uh, where they get some kind of concession from uh, the feds. And, and then let me just, I guess I should add, so, so you know, we did a report uh, early in the year and we sort of laid out the arguments of why um, we think every state will ultimately expand Medicaid. And it goes beyond just the 100% funding by the federal government. Um, as more examples come up again, I, I talked about learning curves. Um, I think as there's more understanding of exactly what, what's happening here, because you're, you're leaving sort of a, a piece of the population bare. So we did an analysis, for example, in an area in Florida uh, you know, somebody that's making $21,000 a year has access to a zero premium plan. Somebody that makes $10,000 a year, so half that, um, has to pay $177 per member per month, right? So that's their, their monthly premium. So just to give you a sense of, you know, kind of the, the discrepancy there just based on how the math works about subsidies being, you know, being available down to 100% of, of FPL. Uh, let's not also forget that, uh, you know, states are essentially paying for Medicaid expansion. So, you know, to the extent you haven't expanded Medicaid, you're essentially paying for other states. So it's not like you're off the hook on that. So I, I, the reason I bring it up is, you know, I think as you move forward, I think more of these points are going to be brought to light. And yes, I think from a Republican standpoint, it's more palatable to come up with some alternative, um, you know, to expand Medicaid. 
I think the problem and the challenge with that is exactly what we're seeing and Carl brought it up in Arkansas, which is essentially when you start shifting to a private option, private option, I would agree with some of the headlines out there, almost by definition has to be more expensive than the Medicaid option. And so that, that's the debate. It, it's, and to the extent that CMS is willing to do that, ultimately at some point that needs to be funded and that becomes another sort of pressure point going forward. I would just add to that. I, I think everything you just said is correct, but I think from the Fed's perspective is get these people into some type of program now because once they have the entitlement, no matter what happens in the political landscape, it's very hard to pull those entitlements back. So it's, um, you know, it sets up for great political theater, but uh, it, I think that's why the government is so willing to, uh, you know, give these governors, uh, you know, a victory, if you will, um, in terms of coming up with their own type of privatized plan. And that's essentially a benefit both for both the payers and providers ultimately, right? The more open market we can have, the more opportunity is for, for both, you know, the hospital side as well as the, uh, as the insurance side. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think what you're seeing, the benefit on the providers, those states that have, that have expanded Medicaid, they're really beginning to see that benefit. And I think it's going to be more and more difficult in those states that choose not to, um, to expand. The providers in those states are really going to have a, they're going to struggle relative to, to the rest of the industry where you've seen that. And I think that's an additional pressure that's going to be um, put upon governors and legislatures by the provider community in those states that they choose not to, to expand. Yeah, well, let, let me try this again. Let me, let's move forward to 2017. And let's say <clears throat> we've had an additional five, eight Medicaid waivers, um, and we have either a Republican or a Democratic president. What happens to the overall Medicaid program at that point? In a sense, what I'm really getting at is, has the experience of granting the waivers and seeing what happens with the waivers, is that going to change Medicaid? Or if you had a Democratic president, will Medicaid just you know, remain as it is? with various concessions to pull states in, or would a Democratic president change it, or would a Republican president change it? Well, I think the, um, yeah, the, there's a rewrite of the Medicaid regulations that's happening right now, and I think is, uh, is going to be out in the next couple of months. So I think the, um, you know, as, you, as you look at some of the, the recent waivers, um, you know, it gives you some indications of some of the things that uh, you know, will be in there that will potentially change the Medicaid program. So for example, uh, much more focused on quality uh, you know, than I've seen previously. Uh, so as an example, uh, as opposed to just allocating members, you have three plans, each one of them gets a third of the market, giving more members to the plans that show higher quality ratings. Um, so you know, as an example, by 2017, will there be a STARS program for Medicare, or excuse me, for Medicaid? May not be the STARS program, but something sort of moving in that direction, um, you know, I think is likely. Uh, one thing I think you're going to see um, that's going to change in Medicaid is you will have a national minimum medical loss ratio for Medicaid, um, the same way that you do in the uh, in the commercial and the Medicare business. It you know, won't be that impactful in Medicaid because most of them are well above that threshold. Uh, but for those markets that have been extraordinarily profitable for health plans, so think of places now like Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, it'll be more difficult for the plans to. Uh, to generate that, um, and then I think one other um, you know, difference is there's going to be I think much more national view on uh, provider availability. So what does the definition have to be you know, of an available provider uh, you know, across to, to to give some standardization to what is today you know, significant variance across the states? Good. Uh, let me move on to <clears throat> uh, to spending trends. And since our conference last year, the low spending trends have continued <clears throat> and have received quite a bit of attention in the research community. Much of the debate is focused on the relative importance of the recession and the timing of its impact versus other factors that, <clears throat> that might prove more longstanding. From your perspective, what have been the key factors behind the last few years of relatively low spending trends, and uh, what, what about your outlook for the next five years? Uh, I'll kick this one off. Sure. Uh, sure. So I, I think uh, <coughs> you've, you, you kind of have to look at it from the, the payer perspective and the provider perspective, but first, if you just tackle it from the provider perspective, I mean, 
you had uh, obviously a, a recession we know about. Um, you know, only one person working. Elective procedures generally went away. That was um, to be expected. It happened. Another reason I think spending was less is you had a uh, a big push from the racks in terms of uh, going and after uh, site of service. So in the racks, you mean the re the uh, the recovery audit contractors? Audit, yes. Yeah. So going after short stays versus whether or not they should be in outpatient observation, whatnot. So the reimbursement levels between those two are quite significant. So as the racks were in there um, giving the hospitals uh, a, a hard time on the claim side, you saw a dramatic shift in terms of the way in which providers were uh, categorizing patients, whether they were inpatient or they were outpatient. That happened at the exact same time as the recession. Um, so I think that also, uh, when you just look at the numbers, made it look smaller. The other thing I think you saw was, you know, the um, high deductible plans have grown uh, exponentially year over year, and the, the level of the deductible is also growing exponentially. So, you know, people are thinking twice before they go to the doctor. And when you look at some of these plans, I mean, the take for instance, you're a bronze plan with a family and you've got a deductible north of $8,000. Average household income is in the fifty thousand dollar range. You're you're talking almost, you know, ten percent, twenty percent of people's income after tax to go to healthcare. People are really thinking twice before they go to the doctor. And now what you're seeing a lot of um, in the hospitals is the people who are there are there because they have to be there. They're very sick, very old. Um, patients that are that are really driving uh, the occupancy levels in the hospital. So I would say when you kind of combine all those and the impact of medication therapy management programs that all the uh, payers have been pushing, there's more reason to keep people out of the hospital. And that, I think, is why you've seen the spending trends decline. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think from the provider side, which is where I spend most of my time, you know, on the hospital side, I think, as you said, if you look on the government side with Medicare, I mean, there's just been cuts in terms of reimbursement. And the two midnight rule is just another, it's essentially a reimbursement cut. And I think that that's had a, a profound impact. And, and I think also some of the quality efforts um, in terms of reducing readmission rates, you know, that has had an impact in terms of the growth in spending. And then on the uh, commercial side, the high deductible plans have had a dramatic impact. We saw that in 2013, that um, we saw inpatient volumes really materially change. What it means going forward, you know, have we sort of hit that equilibrium point where maybe we're at stasis and we're going to begin to see now growth going forward? I guess that's the $64,000 question. But I think, you know, to this point, we have seen that, that spending trend being bent by Medicare and then also plan redesigns and the, and the creation of high deductible plans has really uh, impacted volumes. I guess I, guess I would just add that, um, you know, so, so while there are cyclical elements, we, we're firmly in the camp that believe it's, it's been more structural than it's been cyclical in terms of, uh, of lower spending. You look back over the last uh, four or five years, I think national health expenditure growth has been in that sort of 4% range down from um, call it high single digits, so you know essentially cut in half, if you will, in terms of a, of, of growth rate. Um, and I think you know some of it is is clearly some level economic. So could you get a little bounce off that bottom? Sure. But I think when you look at the projections from HHS on a long term basis, um, you know I think the ex estimation sort of outside of this year with that sort of pop related to reform over the next couple of years, the steady state growth rate um, seems to be in the six percent ish range. Um, and, and I guess. From our perspective, we think that I'd be willing to sort of take the under on that, if you will. Um, I just, from a utilization perspective, I, I think generally speaking, once we normalize for the new populations coming in, um, you know, inpatient utilization is probably running in the has been running in the negative territory. Adjusted admissions, including uh, or adjusting for the outpatient side, has probably been zero to one percent um, type growth. Um, and then on the pricing side, I mean, there's no. Pricing is going in, likely to go only in one direction, and so you're going to get further pressure on the pricing side. When you say when you add those two elements together, you're probably looking, you know, 
our guess would probably be somewhere in the four to five percent range as opposed to um, sort of a jump to, to six or, or seven percent. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the, the, the problem I have with the structural argument, um, yeah, sort of a couple things. So one is like high deductible plans have grown, but they're still, depending on what source you want to use, under 20 percent of the population. So, you know, is that big enough to drive what we've seen nationally? Uh, cost sharing has increased, but, you know, deductibles and cost sharing generally have been rising forever. So what is it about the last couple of years that, you know, did we just hit a tipping point where people just suddenly, you know, stop spending. When you put in the context of the economy being down, um, you know, then those higher cost sharing, uh, you know, could, could make more sense. Uh, yeah, I guess the other argument I would make is all of these things that have been mentioned have continued the last couple of years, in many cases have increased the last couple of years, and yet as you look at overall cost trends, which decelerated for about a decade, stabilized in 2013, I would argue have started to pick up in 2014. So if all of these other structural changes are having the impact that they've had, why have cost trends not continued to decelerate? And, you know, thinking here specifically about the commercial business, uh, you know, in 13 and 14, and as I said, in some cases in 14, have actually started to pick up again. Yeah, and I would just add to that, if you talk um, to the publicly traded hospitals, the majority of them are citing core growth is driving um, – their outperformance recently. It's not from, they're, they're trying to downplay the, the new populations, whether it be through Medicaid or whether uh, through the exchanges. So I think you're right. I think we are starting to, to see a turn. I think we've hit the trough level. The real question is, does it, how, how much, how steep is that curve off the bottom? And that's, that's what's going to be debated going forward because um, like Carl said, I, I, the trend is definitely changing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But the question is, is it, is it going to reaccelerate and get to a level where it was pre the Great Recession? I, I would say it probably looks a little bit different just because in you know, 2007 or so, the health insurance marketplace, just the, the, the products that are offered out there today look a whole lot different than they did um, a few years ago. So the only other thing I was going to say is that, you know, I, I, would, I would agree on the debate of sort of the bounce off the bottom. Um, so certainly costs have, have come up. You know, the question of whether it's sort of, you know, core versus uh, reform is a more difficult one to, to answer. Um, so whereas the providers have sort of the argument of seeing core growth, uh, you know, managed care continues to suggest that their underlying core um, remains sort of flat or even or even negative. And, you know, from their perspective, I think the argument is that they're looking at the same 100 people that had insurance last year to the same 100 people that, are, that have insurance this year and sort of comparing those trends and making the argument that, you know, what they're seeing at least to this point is flat to down. Um, you know, we could certainly debate whether that's true or not. Um, you know, from a provider side, I think it, it you know, they're certainly seeing some level, but it's harder for them to measure because you don't necessarily have the same patients coming in um, kind of on a year-to-year on -year basis. So um, I think there's some considerations there. I think the other element to this, and it goes, again, it goes back to sort of the, keep coming back to this learning curve. Um, I, so yes, it, it, there's, it's not a new phenomenon in terms of having, you know, higher deductibles, you know, coming into play. Um, those higher deductibles, though, you have to utilize healthcare in order to sort of get hit with those higher deductibles. So to the extent that, you know, you start to actually utilize the system above and beyond going to your doctor um, and having other complications, which may take a um, year, two years, three years to actually come up, the learning curve then is understanding what the actual cost is. And then the argument to the other side is, you know, whether or not you have sort of the transparency element of individuals actually looking for, you know, lower costs sources of care, right? Trying to avoid the ER and utilizing urgent care. Um, you know, there's obviously a robust growth in urgent care and freestanding ED as sort of cheaper alternatives. So I, th I just think that's the other angle to this is that, yes, this is not necessarily a new phenomenon, but I would, I would just wonder, um, you know, whether or not individuals are starting to understand that and starting to be more conscious of it and, and looking for alternatives to try and lower costs given that it's, uh, you know, it's pretty significant, obviously, and, and just rising. Yeah, let me move on to uh, one aspect of, of cost trends is specialty pharmacy. 
That's growing robustly. I understand that uh, Savaldi treatment for hepatitis C uh, is having a large enough effect on spending that you can notice it in the overall trends. And the question is, are there other blockbuster specialty drugs approaching introduction that are going to just compound this, uh, this phenomenon? Well, I, I would just say, first of all, on the Savaldi front, the reason why Savaldi is as, as powerful as it is is that it's a cure. So you're not just talking a specialty pharma drug that, that treats XYZ symptoms. You're talking about something that cures something. So you're, it's a very hard for a payer to say, no, I'm not going to cure you. Uh, that doesn't really sit well with people. What you have seen, though, in terms of trying to slow down the trend because it's, it's come out of nowhere, um, they're, they're requiring more biopsies. They're requiring much more documentation specialists ahead of time before they actually prescribe that therapy. In terms of specialty pharma going forward, I think it's north of 50% of the, the pipeline right now at FDA is full of uh, specialty pharma drugs, whether it be biologics, biosimilars. Um, so that, that trend is here to stay, I believe. I just think the, the managed care companies are going to be much more aggressive in terms of um, getting prior authorizations and um, uh, trying to manage how those uh, therapies are utilized. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, um, you know, what, what struck me earlier in the year is so WellPoint um, is, you know, the company in the publicly traded universe most exposed to reform. Um, and their CEO was on a panel earlier in the year, and he got that ubiquitous question of, you know, what is it that keeps you up at night? Uh, and so you expect he's going to uh, say, you know, it's reform and all the uncertainty, and his response, specialty pharma. Uh, you know, that's the thing that I worry about the most uh, over the next, uh, next few years. Uh, so I thought that was kind of striking. You know, I think one of the, the challenges that the, uh, the insurance companies have is that specialty pharma is extremely difficult for them to manage. Uh, you know, part of it is because it's delivered, in many cases, through the medical benefit as opposed to the pharma benefit. But even more fundamentally, all of the normal cost-sharing mechanisms that the plans use don't really work for specialty pharma. So for example, you think about you know, what we've talked about, deductibles, cost-sharing generally. With specialty pharma, you get one dose, and you've hit your out-of-pocket max. Um, so you know, that doesn't work anymore. Um, so trying to find different ways to manage, you know, whether it is uh, you know, prior authorization, step, all of the, the things that uh, you know, the plans have done historically, there aren't at least from, from what I've seen, a lot of uh, you know, new and interesting things that have been, been really effective to this point. And, and the only thing I'd add, so HealthNet CEO said the same thing when we had them um, out on the road um, in terms of what keeps them up at night. Um, same thing, sort of specialty pharma. So obviously there's a, there's a trend here and something to keep an eye on. Just to, to think about the numbers, um, you know, there's estimates out there that, you know, total spending on uh, specialty pharma I think is in the hundred and – Thirty billion dollar range, um, going to two hundred and fifty billion dollars uh, by I think twenty eighteen. Um, so that's something like fifteen twenty percent growth on on a per year on a very big number. So um, this is an issue, and you know again how to how to tackle it. It gets more difficult, certainly from the um, you know from the payer side of things. And so that's certainly going to influence, um, you know, premiums as you think about some of the trends going forward, um, you know, that plans are going to have to price in. And, you know, outside of specialty drugs, are there any new technologies coming down the pike that have gotten your attention as far as something which you could have a big increase, positive or negative, on the spending trends? Well, I was going to say the... Um, I think there's a lot going on in terms of, of price transparency and, and consumerism. I think that's the thing from a uh, from a provider standpoint. Is you look out over, you know, the next four to five years, is the whole idea of of you know your cell phones and providing transparency data to allow people to get that that information to make those decisions. You know, if you if you believe on the commercial side that that we're going to continue to see an increase in high deductible plans, I think the consumerism and the ability to shop for pricing for various procedures, I think, is, is something that keeps a lot of the providers up at night in terms of how they're going to tackle that. And from a, from a pricing standpoint, how they're going to move from, a whole, from the wholesale side of the business into the retail side of the business. Yeah, let's, let's get back to that a yeah. little bit later. Uh, any 
I'm not surprised that people didn't come up, because I've never known anyone who could identify the next major technology before it actually hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, not a new technology, but I say one, one thing they've yeah. seen more from the plans uh, in terms of management focus is, uh, is pain management. Um, yeah. So, you know, sort of started with imaging and radiology uh, a couple of years ago, and you know, now it seems like, um, you know, focus is shifting to, uh, you know, predominantly back pain. Um, but in terms of resource, uh, you know, where they're putting the resources, uh, you know, make a number up, it seems like, 90 or 95 percent of the focus is specialty pharma, and you know, the, the rest is elsewhere. Did, does anyone see much potential for increasing emphasis on wellness to actually make a dent in the spending trends? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 not a believer. Um, <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting if you if you survey benefit managers, you know, one of the things that will come up most frequently is interest in wellness programs. Uh, it seems very reminiscent of you know a decade ago, give or take, when you do the same thing and everybody's focused on disease management. Uh, you know, it seems like sort of the, the the thing that they want to focus on. But when you get to the next question of well, how much money does it save you? It's like, I don't know. Uh, do you have any way to measure it? Not really. <laughs> uh, so. You know, it, it just feels like one of those things that's interesting to have, uh, but wellness by itself doesn't get you anywhere. In the sense, like people that smoke, know they should stop smoking. Or if you're overweight, you know, you know you should exercise and you know take better care of yourself. And the wellness program will help educate you that, that you should do that. But what does it actually makes you start doing those things? Um, and you know, I, I don't think there's been a uh, you know a lot out there um, you know that's shown the ability to know, actually um, make that happen. I think one of the frustrations that our benefit manager has every single year is we'll do health risk assessments and various things like that. Uh, and the frustrating piece is that it's the marathon runners and all the people that are in really good shape that are willing to fill out the health risk assessment. <laughs> uh, and, you know, all those that are not, you know, it's much harder to, uh, you know, to, to get that compliant. So, uh, you know, as I said, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a huge believer in that being a, uh, a real cost run driver. I, I think the issue for that is just, again, to Carl's point, it's just how do you measure return um, for making an investment in that? And I think it's difficult because you could certainly have a population base and you could see your potentially your trend down, but to directly associate it with wellness, I think, is uh, is what most firms, um, including our own, we've talked to our benefit managers as well. And, you know, it, there, there's a line you want to draw of sort of the, the carrot and, and the stick type argument. You know, how far do you want to go where you start to actually punish employees for not, um, you know, complying. And I think for the most part, corporations have been unwilling um, to go there or if they went there, uh, you know, very, uh, very slowly making that transition. Um, and, and I don't know that that's really going to, uh, to take hold much. Yeah. yeah, I guess another factor which uh, I'm sure you also have in mind is the fact, is the turnover issues. You know, the fact that uh, wellness is an investment based on an employer or plan, and your subscribers or your employees are going to turn over. So you're not going to realize all the fruits of any investment. Um, next section is on innovative contracting between Medicare, private health plans, and providers. And I want to begin by asking you about uh, what are the provider perspectives on ACOs, accountable care organizations? You know, How do they perceive the opportunity of, of this type of contracting? Well, I would say, at least on the not-for-profit side, you know, the, the Pioneer ACO product has been something that clearly, I think there were 32 original Pioneer programs, it might have been more, but they've since, you know, you've seen a lot of organizations pull back on that. I think the structure of the plan and the fact that there's no uh, attribution within the Pioneer ACO makes it very difficult for organizations to stay in that program. I think the Medicare shared service, uh, shared savings program has been something that uh, you're seeing a gravitation towards. And I think there's, there is, um, you know, been, you know, been a movement there and an acceptance and, um, you know, more to, to get the providers to build up that experience in, in regards to, um, you know, working with populations, managing populations, and really putting into place. And, and it's, it's more sort of testing different uh, things in terms of delivery of care that is that has been beneficial for them. So I don't think it's so much the financial incentives, but it's really 
being able to test out some things and, and you know, work as an organization towards more population health management um, approaches. Uh, so I, I think the, uh, the pioneer specifically, so I think we just have to step back for a second. So when people mention ACOs, they're all, there's several different forms and fashions. Uh, the one that we know the most about would be the pioneer ACO model. The managed care companies talk about ACOs all the time, but yeah. unfortunately we don't get to see the way those contracts are written and they like to boast about them, but we don't actually know if they work or they don't work because they don't like to talk about when things don't work. <laughs> but we know that half of the pioneer, uh, call it half, have dropped out, which is highly significant when you think about it because the 32 that were originally there were, were your very large name brand, uh, delivery systems, and if they can't do it, then how can you expect a hospital out uh, in rural America to be able to do it as well? Uh, that would be point number one. Point number two, you know, the, the ACOs are a great concept. I think only good can come from them, but from a financial perspective for the, the hospitals, it doesn't really make much sense because what you're essentially doing is, look at the pioneers, for, for example. There's no managed care company that's driving it. The hospital is not a very good at taking risk. We've seen that before they fail. Um, there's no reimbursement that I know of inside the pioneer model that compensates them for the back office. So all of the infrastructure that's needed to manage this population that's all under the umbrella of a health plan, and they're not getting reimbursed for that. And what's happening is, as they're taking money out of the system, it's great, you've helped people, and if you went from $100 to 90, I get five, you get five, that's great, but then the benchmark starts to fall. And then what happens is the hospital is essentially losing margin on the next customer that comes in the door. So the only way in which it makes financial sense for a hospital is you need more market share. So you're either gonna buy the next hospital, you're gonna buy the next doctor group, and you have to keep feeding that system in order to make it financially viable for them. And you know we're, we're talking in times where we talked about health trends, or spending trends here, coming down um, with everything we talked about before, inpatient to outpatient, <coughs> Um, racks and uh, you know other aggressive treatments from the managed care companies, and I, I think that if the ACOs were working, you had you know half of the pioneers drop out. So there's an inherent flaw in the model. Yeah, actually, that's what I wanted to probe as to how much of it is inherent in the model, and how much of it is the specifics of the model at this point. For example, you know we're. Uh, expecting uh, today or next week, um, you know, new re regulations for at least Medicare share savings programs, and so in a sense, to agree to fix some of the issues like attribution. But uh, I think what you're saying is that it probably goes beyond that. There's something more inherent. Yeah. Well, well I mean, just take the Pioneer for example. And to my knowledge, I don't know if this has been changed in it, or I think it's they tried to mitigate it. But um, you know, you're. you're retroactively assigning populations to a health system that's not even good at taking risk in the first place. So how can you manage a population if you don't know who's in your population? It just, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that I think will be fixed. But, um, but in order for it to work, you have to, you have to keep them in that network, a very tight, right. restrictive HMO style network, which does not sit well with people. So how do you strike that balance? We saw the HMOs, the real restrictive HMOs of the 90s all fail because people didn't like just having to stay with that one gatekeeper who tells them what they can and cannot do. So I, I think until people can, can accept that reality, the model doesn't really work. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the pioneer ACO model didn't work because the fragmentation of the provider net, I mean, because because you're not attributed those lives and the fragmentation in terms of the provider network or the providers uh, within the country, it just doesn't work. I mean, 
I think what I hear a lot from the provider side is that the Medicare Advantage plans, they, they like that because you are attributed lives and you can keep them, you, you, you know who they are and you can, you can identify them. With the Pioneer ACO, it's retroactive and, and people move in, move out, but there's no way you can keep them within, within your organization or within your network. And it just, it, I think from a design standpoint, it, it's, it's flawed unless you're in a market where you've got, but even, even ban, uh, um, Banner was in the, uh, the Pioneer ACO, and they've, they've got a fairly large market share in the Phoenix market, and, and still, I think, without having the ability to know who those lives are that you're taking care of, it just didn't work for them. The only thing I'd add, I guess, is that, you know, I guess hospitals and most providers are rev very revenue protected. So, again, to Nick's point, if the argument is you have a hundred million of revenue and you save ten million and you get five million back, so great. Now I got ninety five million versus a hundred million before. Right. So <laughs> it just that that's that's the inherent flaw. One, for a industry that again is revenue protected. Now again, the argument on the other side would be you have to become more efficient, you have to take more costs out because it's not a revenue game, it's an EBITDA game or an earnings game. Um but I think to this to the point, you know, with a high fixed cost infrastructure, I think they're finding and it's been more challenging to actually get the cost to net out sort of positive above and beyond where you were before. So then brings up the other element, um, which is market share gains and or exclusion of somebody out of network. Right. So to the extent you have, you know, five hospitals in an area, each one generating 20 million of revenue. If you knock one out, then there's four hospitals with 25 million, arguably, of revenue. And so to the extent that their savings, even for a couple few million dollars off of that number, the, the system essentially s saves, but there is one, one hospital essentially um, you know, left out. So I, I think these are all things that you know, are going to have to be sort of worked on or, or understood. I mean, we, we do conferences every year, and I think for the last three or four years, um, you know, we've had... A, consultants come up and talk about ACOs and they leave and I'm more confused about an ACO than I was going in. So um, I think part of the part of the issue is that there's no uh, one definition or structure of it. Um, ultimately, you know, the, again, the I think the, the end result has to be a provider system that's incented more on on savings um, than it is on on revenue generation. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, with the model you're mentioning, that's what I've seen in California as the typical way ACOs are employed. It's usually as part of a, as part of a tiered network mm -hmm. approach is where there are actually incentives for the enrollees to use the ACO providers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're already HMO patients, so they're already attributed. Uh, but, the, uh, but it's a good point that perhaps this early stage of complete volunteerism is a very difficult stage to get through. And in commercial ACOs or similar things, uh, maybe they'll be more effective with uh, engaging consumers on a, uh, on a network basis. And in Medicare, it'll probably come down to actually giving bonuses or penalties for whether a provider is in an ACO or not, so that it's not completely voluntary. And you have this very challenging benchmark problem that Nick has mentioned. Well, I, I think it just works a lot better if, if a managed care plan is in charge of managing a population. Mm. That's their business. Yeah. They're good at it. Um, to make a hospital responsible for that and then not even reimburse. Uh, Ralph was talking about the cost side and I think your point was on, on in terms of how much they're spending in terms of caring for the patient. But the costs are also going up for them on the other side of all of these things that go into running one of these models and where's the reimbursement for that? So. You know, maybe the plan, maybe they should just run their own health plans. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know, but I just, uh, the pioneer plant model as it exists today, I, I just, I just, I don't see it working. Good point. Well, what about bundle payment? Is that pretty much the same as ACOs, or, or do you think there's some distinctions in whether they're attractive to providers? So there's a lot of debate about this. Um, bundling... If you talk to uh, a company like Kindred Healthcare, they think that the bundle is the way of the future and that everything is going to be uh, paid through a, a bundle basis. The, the, there's just so many 
questions about bundles. We don't know who runs the bundle. Is it the hospital? Is it a health insurance plan? Who gets what cut from the bundle? Does the ERF get 20%? Does the hospital get 50%? I mean, there's just so many unknowns in terms of working those kinks out that I don't see the bundle really taking off. Um, I think it, it comes maybe with, they try it with certain DRGs and whatnot, but on a broad basis, anytime soon, I, I don't see it proliferating into the market. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna say, I think the, you know, again, we've seen it where some of the hospital providers that are more integrated, that they've got a large employed physician base that are trying the bundles. I don't think that they're, to be quite honest with you, I don't think they're really excited about it. I think they think that this is the future. But again, you've got a medical staff that's largely fee for service that you're trying to, you know, for trying these bundles and it, it's, it gets really difficult in terms of how you're gonna start to cut up the pie uh, and, and how you incent physicians, you know, uh, to accept on these bundles and move forward with it. So, you know, again, I think that they're trying it because they know that it's the way of the future. I'm not sure at this point that you're gonna see a lot of growth uh, without some sort of incentive or it being forced upon them. Good. Do you see much activity in, for those that are doing bundles, uh, particularly doing bundles in Medicare, do you see much activity in the post-acute area about attempts to uh, manage post-acute care to partner with post-acute providers? And is there anyone good to partner with if they're doing that? I think, I mean, yeah, I think on the post-acute side, we're, you know, I, I think what we're seeing a lot of is, is joint venturing, um, you know, and, and part of that is, I don't know if that's directly related to the, to the bundle or, or not, but I think, um, you know, certainly from the, from the hospital side, from the home health side, um, you know, some of the outsourcing providers, um, Envision, um, and Team Health, you know, there, there's more of a, of sort of a willingness to uh, joint venture with providers, and I think, um, in some of those scenarios, I think the winning uh, the winning argument is ultimately that you know sort of you control the whole continuum there, um, but you're not um, solely responsible. So from a hospital side, you're not really necessarily taking on the risk. You join in some level of of earnings, um, but at the same time, you don't necessarily even provide that service. It's sort of outsourced someplace else. So um, I think we're seeing more of that. Uh, you know, coming up as opposed to, you know, a real, you know, effort on the bundling side, maybe, maybe uh, aside from Kindred. I mean, Kindred's been sort of the most um, public, uh, you know, in terms of bundling uh, payments. I think part of the, part of the problem even with bundling is, again, given the fragmentation of, of healthcare. Um, sure, there's areas where you have large integrated health systems, but by and large, when you look across the, um, you know, across the country, you, you don't necessarily have that. So I think there's going to be more partnerships going forward, um, you know, maybe as opposed to thinking that, uh, you know, hospitals are going to try to sort of run it, you know, run it all. Because I think in the past, you know, we've just come off of, you know, in the last decade, we've come off of hospitals sort of unraveling all these sort of post-acute services. I don't know that they're just going to run back in to sort of start acquiring them. So I think the route is more, um, you know, via joint venture, which sort of limits some level of risk on the, uh, on the provider side. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I would just also point out hospitals, I think, are also really incentivized to kind of want to joint venture or do something because um, they're ultimately responsible if there's a, a, an unnecessary readmission um, the, the, they're getting penalized from the government from that. So on one hand, the hospital doesn't own those services downstream, but they're also incented to try to help that patient navigate so that if they do boomerang back, they don't, or they try to prevent them from boomeranging back so that way they don't get a penalty um, if, if they do come back. Mm -hmm. Good. And do you, have you seen much in the area of hospitals actually getting into the insurance business either on their own or as a joint venture with an insurance company? You know, I would say you're, you're beginning to see that. I think some of the hospital systems that I talked to, you know, it wasn't too long ago that you were seeing them move out of the insurance business um, and, and sell that off. I think some of the hospitals, and again, it sort of depends on each market. It depends on your size and scale within a market. 
I think that there's a lot of interest among hospital providers in terms of developing that insurance um, capability, but, but um, a lot of it's going to depend on, on what sort of scale you have in a market. Um, I think that there is some interest among providers, assuming you've got that scale, to doing entering into some direct contracting if you've got large employer groups where they can come in and um, on those self-insured employers where they can come in and, and look at the claims data and maybe enter into a contract. I think that um, it's a trend that's going to continue to move forward because I keep coming back to the hospitals, um, you know, the whole idea of reducing readmissions, improving clinical uh, outcomes, you know, uh, managing chronic conditions without without controlling that premium dollar over the longer term, I think it, I think it, you know, you're going to see revenues come down, you're going to see margins get compressed if you're sharing with that, sharing that, that savings, and then every year that sort of gets reset. So I think that there is interest among the providers to develop the insurance uh, capability, whether or not they need to do that all on their own or whether they can partner with, with some of the large insurance plans. I think every market's a little different. You're seeing, I think the insurers are seeing that as well. I think in certain markets you're seeing them come together with large providers to to maybe develop a joint insurance plan where they can share in that. Yeah, I mean, you, you've, you've seen some uh, hospitals form insurers, so Long Island Jewish uh, you know, has one in, in New York that, the, that has started up, but for the most part, not really. Um, it, it's more one of those things that sounds interesting in theory, uh, and then when you actually start putting it into practice, uh, you know, beyond the, the capital that's required uh, to run an insurance operation, you, you need experts in product design distribution, uh, all the regulatory compliance, uh, particularly you know, in most cases the hospitals would be interested in getting into the Medicare business. Um, so yeah, I think the challenge for a lot of hospital executives is you get to the point where you say, okay, basically every core competency we're going to outsource to some vendor except for the network contracting piece. Um, so yeah, we're getting into this business we don't understand, we're outsourcing pretty much everything. You know, is this really the direction we want to go? Uh, you know, I think a, a slightly different angle uh, you know, to that question is you know, if you look at some of the acquisitions that managed care companies have done, uh, you know, I think it, if it hasn't, I think it should make uh, you know, hospitals pause as they think about getting into the insurance business. So think about uh, Cigna buys HealthSpring, which is a Medicare company, really innovative risk-sharing relationships with providers. The idea is to take that HealthSpring model roll it out all across Cigna's geographies. Uh, you know, that deal was done years ago. There's been very minimal expansion. Uh, you know, DeVita buys healthcare partners, uh, you know, big, uh, one of the best uh, risk takers out in California. The idea is you're going to roll that out into a lot of new markets. DeVita has tried to do that, and you know, that's one of the reasons why they've ended up losing so much money on that deal. Um, the point that I make is that you have health plans buying companies that are really, really good at what they do from a risk-taking perspective, and when they try to roll it out in new geographies, it either takes a very long time uh, or it just doesn't work. So if you're taking companies that are really good at what they're doing and they have trouble rolling out in new geographies, if you're a hospital or a provider group generally and you're starting from zero, um, you know, why do you expect that you're going to be successful? Uh, you know, there, there has to be a very specific uh, you know, reason uh, or competitive advantage that the hospital thinks they bring to the table uh, to really make that work. And, and just, uh, I guess just to add to that, you know, vertical integration certainly is interesting. I mean, uh, you know, to Carl's point, I mean, I think part of the issue is fragmentation within just healthcare again and the ability to actually sort of roll this out broader clearly is a, is a challenge. That said, uh, from the public uh, hospital perspective, we did have one, uh, Universal Health Services, UHS, uh, recently bought a small plan out in Nevada. And um, in talking to the management team, it, it's clear they're just sort of putting their toe in the water, just seeing if they can, you know, kind of operate it. So I think, you know, I think, yes, generally speaking, most hospitals are saying they're not interested or that, you know, that's not their core competency or business. And the other side of it is you are starting to see some signals out there um, of some you know, just taking that little step um, and maybe seeing if they can make it work. 
Um, again, all the dynamics that we talked about earlier, all the pressures that we talked about earlier, um, I think hospitals are aware and understand that their business models need to change. And um, they're not maybe not exactly sure how it's going to change, but they want to be in play in a, in a part of that um, to see if this can uh, you know, work and translate to something more successful. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's move on. The uh, Carl, <coughs> no voice today. Carl, uh, <coughs> you had mentioned before about your skepticism of uh, uh, <coughs> what uh, plans were telling you about their experience with uh, affordable, you know, payment reform. <coughs> What's your sense about uh, uh, how interested are they in pursuing these initiatives? And so to what extent is, uh, is self-insurance getting in the way as far as of their ability to contract with providers on ACO-like or bundled payments, bases? Sure. Yeah, so I think um, the health <coughs> insurers in general are extremely interested in ACOs, risk sharing, <coughs> you know, and any kind of payment reform. So yeah, a couple of points to think about. So one is if cost trends are at cyclical lows, why wouldn't you want to outsource and put all the risk on somebody else? That way, if cost trends rebound, um, you know, you're not going to foot the full bill. Um, so you know, I think that that's one angle. Uh, you know, second is that you know, health, health insurance is a spread business, right? You're trying to price more than what your costs are going to be. The more costs that you know on January 1st of every year, the easier it is to price your business. Uh, and if you think about that from you know, sort of the way that we would look at it, the less risk that a managed care company has, the higher valuation multiple that they're going to get. Um, yeah, so if you can generate a similar amount of earnings, but you're, doing, you're taking on less risk to do it, uh, you know, that's going to translate into a, a higher valuation for the industry. So yeah, I think there's a lot of interest. Um, yeah, I think there's also <coughs> proven success if you do this right. So if you look at most utilization metrics in California, where there is a high level of, uh, of risk sharing with providers, uh, pretty much every utilization metric is 20 to 40 percent lower in California than it is the rest of the country. Uh, you know, the one where it's not is pharmacy, but that makes sense that pharmacy should be higher. Um, so, you know, I think there, you know, plans would look at that and say, you know, if we're looking at a steady drop in medical cost trends over the next couple of years because we're outsourcing, like cost trends going down. Uh, you know, is a good thing for, for managed care earnings. Um, so I, I think there's a ton of interest. You know, the holdup, as you know, we've touched on here, is that my argument at least would be <coughs> very few providers in the country are, have the capability uh, to take on <coughs> risk uh, and, and do it effectively. Um, you, know, you can't just assume risk. You have to completely change your practice patterns. So you need step one, an electronic medical record. Uh, but on top of that, you've got to have some analytical capability that tells the doctor what they should do. Uh, so there's an analytics company. I'm going to make these numbers up a little bit. But you know, what they said is that if you just leave a doctor on their own um, and there's something that they should recommend a patient do, uh, something like, I don't remember the numbers, 3% or 8% of the time, the doctor will tell the patient they should do that. Uh, if you actually have an analytic system that flags it, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the time, the doctor will do what's best for the patient. It's not because doctors are bad at their jobs, it's just they're seeing 30 or 40 patients a day, and that three minutes that they spend in the office, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough to, uh, you know, to have a lot of uh, effect there. So, you know, I think you, you do need a, a fundamental reworking of the practice patterns, and, you know, something that Nick mentioned, there's a lot of uh, back office administrative costs that, uh, you know, that, that goes into that, that, uh, you know, the providers would have to uh, foot the bill for. Good. Let me move on to narrow network plans. And I uh, want to just pose a big question first. Uh, you know, what kind of influence is the growth of these products been having on the uh, marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a very significant impact. Um, yeah, I think, you know, particularly in some of the more retail offerings like the exchange products. Uh, you know, I think the you know, couple things I would think about for uh, narrow networks, um, you know, I think to grow an important. So one is I would say that there's absolutely nothing wrong with a narrow network. Uh, the problem that you ran into in 2014 is that many times consumers didn't know they were buying a narrow network and had no ability to find out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember going on 
you know, either some of the state or, or healthcare.gov, and trying to find a provider directory uh, was a near impossibility. Uh, and then if you did find a provider directory, it was one of 50, uh, and it was very difficult to tell who was actually in one network. So I think the plans need to do a much better job uh, of you know, being transparent with consumers and you know, for them to, uh, you know, to, uh, to understand uh, you know, who is actually uh, you know, in, in that narrow network. Um, you know, I think the, the other uh, issue that, that you often run into, and this is more on the group side of the business, is that narrow networks can't take off until you get more savings for cutting out the network. Um, you know, again, I'm gonna make these numbers up a little bit, uh, but you know, if you move to a narrow network that has 80% of the physicians in it, you can save maybe five to 15%. Uh, if you want to save you know, 15, 20, 25%, you'd have to cut out something like 60 to 80% of the provider network. Uh, so you gotta get a point from the insurer perspective where the reductions in the provider network you know, are, don't have to be that significant to generate real savings um, you know, for it to work in a, uh, in a group setting. Yeah, to what extent do uh are these networks being built on strictly low unit prices versus, say, more sophisticated assessments as to how expensive different providers are? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, at this point, uh, yeah, in initially, I think it is very much driven by unit price as opposed okay. to quality metrics. I mean, I think the, the hope is that ultimately you can get to a point where there's a uh, a mix of the two, but you know, at this point, I think it's very much unit price driven. But, you know, and I, th I think managed care plans are actually, um, onto that point though or, or suggest they're onto that point united certainly talked about it where you know you just don't you're just not looking for cheap you want quality ahead right because to the extent that you know somebody's treating uh an illness via sort of one admission versus somebody else treating them via three admissions for that same um you know procedure obviously you know you'd want you'd want the one with the higher quality so um to call's point i would absolutely agree i think right now it's it's largely all price driven, um, but I think there are analytical tools, and I think managed care is trying to put those in place where um, you know you maybe want the larger, more sophisticated system over sort of the smaller, potentially not for profit, um, to the extent that that larger system has better quality data. Again, whether or not that's true in every market's going to vary, but um, I do think that's something that's going to evolve and going to become incrementally more important. I think that's why on the provider side, um, there's more of an effort to sort of enhance those quality metrics to make sure there is some level of differentiation so that they can sort of make that case when you go to managed care is, yeah, maybe I'm priced a little bit more, but look at these quality indicators, look at my readmissions, to sort of make that sales point that you want me in the network as opposed to an inefficient provider. I just still think it's early for that. Yeah, one, one of the inherent challenges to that, though, is that just because a hospital is good at oncology does not mean they're good at cardiology. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, know, you sort of have to do it on average, um, and you, know, you can end up in some, you know, some situations where, you know, on average, it may be the, you know, the highest quality provider in the market, uh, but has some really, really terrible outcomes uh, you know, in, in certain pieces of the uh, of the facility, um, so you know, it does get very complicated when you start trying to get down to, uh, you know, to specific procedure levels. Good. This would be a good time to pause. To for those people that have questions, if you could, you know, write them down and send your blue card over. People start coming by to collect them. Um, okay. Well, so we'll start the questions in a couple of minutes. Um, the uh, let me see. Uh, Actually, the issue of uh, network adequacy, I guess where National Association of Insurance Commissioners just came out with something. Sounds like uh, states will have a lot of decisions to make rather than just blindly follow the model law. Um, I had a question about how, how capable, one of the things that I guess everyone agrees on, the point that Carl made, is the transparency. And our, now that insurers realize that this was, is an issue, um, how capable are they to providing the transparency that people are looking for? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's a, 
I, I think it's a, a very, very significant challenge for them. Um, I think just a, uh, a report out in, uh, in, in California uh, earlier this week looking at, uh, at WellPoint and Blue Shield, and you know, over 10% of the providers uh, listed in the directory you know, aren't in the location that the directory says they are. You know, another 10 to 15 percent of providers uh, aren't actually don't actually accept the insurance, uh, and then you know a whole host of uh, things where they do take the insurance, but they're not accepting new patients. Um, so, you know, the the, the quality of the uh, the provider directories, um, you know, I think has been has been pretty poor. Uh, yeah, you know, I think this is one thing where the plans uh, you know need some some big improvements. Where they all like to talk about how they're becoming much more consumer focused and you know, going to sell at the retail level. Uh, but when it gets to situations like this, uh, you know, a lot of times the plans say, well, it's not our fault. Like, you know, we, send the, we send the information to the providers. We have to rely on them to be accurate. Um, you know, we also have to rely on the front office staff to know who's actually in the insurance plan and whether they're taking it. And they just make lots of mistakes, like nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, the, the plans need to... Uh, you know, basically accept that, you know, there's lots of things that are out of their control, but they need to find a way to work around that. You know, I, I, I would absolutely agree. And, and I actually think there have been some level of improvements. I mean, I did the same thing Carl did last year of going on and trying to find provider networks, right? Because I cover managed care and hospital guys, so it's important to figure out who's in network and who's out of network. And I clearly could not figure that out at all last year. Um, and this year, um, there's some that are still challenging uh, for some plans, but there's others that are much more, uh, you know, sort of transparent, if you will, that's in there. Now, again, whether or not they're truly in or not, or if there's issues, you know, ultimately after you get somebody in and then sort of say they're not in network, I think there's been some of those games, if you will, or um, some concerns around that is a whole other debate. But just from a from a sense or an ability to actually find uh, whether plans are in or out, um, it's certainly been better, at least on the exchange, what we found um, you know, this year over last year. Mm -hmm. I'd also uh, just piggyback on that and say, you really have to also look at it from a, a commercial, um, from, from the perspective of somebody with commercial insurance versus somebody who has Medicaid. Because uh, to Carl's point, you may find somebody who is, uh, participates, but they're not accepting new patients. And then the question becomes, you know, is, is that physician going to then, you know, how much are they going to change their mix of their patient base? Um, you know, especially when your reimbursement level is significantly lower for Medicaid. And I think with Medicaid expansion and all of these people gaining access to the system, that it becomes an even larger issue that the system is going to have to uh, sort, sort out. Thanks. Uh, let me start asking uh, questions. The uh, Actually, this is a good one. I'm finding some of the questions are actually more like judgment about policy rather than judgment <laughs> about markets. And obviously, you admire these, these panelists knowing everything, but I'm not going to ask those. Here's a question. We've seen a correlation between Medicaid expansions and approved hospital bottom lines. How strong is a connection, and would it create pressure for further expansion? Well, I think from... I think from a hospital standpoint, you know, we, what we've seen, again, on, on the, I cover the not-for-profit, so we've got 300 different hospitals that, that we cover, a lot of systems and standalones, but it's been pretty, um, pretty unanimous or consistent that those providers in expansion states are really seeing some improvement. It's not so much you're seeing a reduction in bad debt, but a dropping in charity care, so you're actually seeing, you know, that, that level, that increased revenue that reimbursement is, is is helping their bottom line. It helps offset some of the other pressures that that you know that they're grappling with. Some of the things that we've talked about, such as you know the the two midnight rule and, and um, some of the lower volumes. So yeah, I would say, and we'll we'll be able to have a much better sense as we're getting year end audits. Um, and and I think you know for some of the fellows here that cover the the for profits, I think that they they've seen. For the facilities in the expansion states, I think it's been pretty uniform that it's been a that it's been a, uh, a fairly strong benefit for them. I guess this means that uh, the Medicaid payments, which tend to be low, are higher than marginal costs. Otherwise, this, this think, wouldn't have happened. Well, I, yeah. I think the so so I think the argument is um, 
it's some payment versus no, no payment. payment yeah. So that, that's yeah. the that's the end result is that you know yeah if you bring on incremental volume at Medicaid you know we could certainly sort of have the debate on you know whether that's margin pop profitable or not but from a standpoint of getting paid from an uninsured zero dollars and then you know just to give a, a sense of magnitude on an inpatient admit the average uh, revenue is about five thousand dollars for Medicaid so it's the difference between getting zero versus five thousand that payer mix shift obviously has impact to the bottom line because you were treating that patient arguably uh, last year as well. And I think, I mean, part of the answer too, I think, as always, is it depends where you are um, from the perspective of, let's, if you're a hospital in a state that didn't expand Medicaid, uh, you know, the bad news is you're still getting no reimbursement for your Medicaid patients, but there's also a whole host of people that would have been Medicaid eligible that are now eligible for exchange products and the reimbursement, uh, you know, is much higher on the exchange products than it is on the Medicaid products. So it's theoretically possible if you're a, you know, the rightly positioned hospital to be in a state that didn't expand Medicaid where it's beneficial. Um, now, if you're a safety net hospital and you have no commercial admissions, then you know, not expanding Medicaid is uh, you know, obviously a huge challenge. Yeah, I've got a question here that was coming off our discussion about uh, now networks. And it's about academic medical centers that often, presumably, many academic medical centers won't be included in these networks. Um, I guess with high deductibles and transparency, that might steer some patients away from academic medical centers. So the question is, what are the academic medical centers doing to survive in this more challenging environment? And I don't know, Jim, if you have any thoughts to start off with? Well, I think what, what we've seen is a lot of the academics are building out their network, whether it's through acquisition or through, through alignment with community, uh, community hospitals. Um, you know, so I, I think that that is, is sort of their first step. I think the other question is, is in terms of network design, depending on what market you're looking at. I'm from Chicago. You've got five academic medical centers. That's, most people would say that's probably too many. Um, but I think also in, uh, if you look at a place like Denver, you've got University of Colorado Health System. They've acquired uh, some community hospitals up in Fort Collins, uh, down in Colorado Springs. Question becomes is they're the only academic medical center. So from a provider standpoint, can you afford to not have them in your network? So I think it sort of depends on your marketplace, but clearly the academics are working to make sure that they uh, either through acquisition or through, probably more through acquisition, but through alignment, make sure that they are getting big enough and are a large enough part of the marketplace where they're a must-have in terms of network design. I don't know how you guys feel. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think the, I mean, one, one thing that I've seen from, from the academic medical center, so I guess, you know, first point is individual is still a relatively small piece of the market. Um, so, you know, academic medical centers are generally going to be in all the commercial networks and you know, most of the Medicare networks. So, yeah, I think part of it is, you know, them saying it's not a huge impact. You know, maybe individual won't grow as quickly as everybody says it's going to. Absent that, uh, I think we're, you know, where they're going is really to focus on quality. You know, to say, you know, if you're a Cleveland Clinic, to say we are by far the most expensive hospital in this market, but here's some data showing our quality is, you know, this much better than everybody else. And so even though we seem more expensive, end of the day, we're really not because we will have zero readmissions and, you know, there will be nobody coming back in for another procedure. Um, you know, otherwise, I think it would be uh, you know, a challenge to, to make the case for them to be in. And I guess I would just say, I mean, it really depends on their existing position and their uh, acknowledgement of where they are. In other words, um, you know, with the individual and with the exchanges, I mean, there's renewals every year. So to the extent that um, somebody gets sick intra year and, and wants a more expensive, higher price plan that includes that academic medical center, you'll have a year to sort of re-up every year. So I, I think it just depends on the strategy for the academic medical center and how important that small individual piece is relative to their broader book, assuming that that broader book still exists and, you know, they can continue to sort of price, um, you know, for their existing, uh, existing business. I, the only other thing I would add is, is simply the, the leverage for a hospital in, in a negotiation is market share. So to the extent that you have the most market share, um, you, know, you, can, you can really try to um, 
make sure you, you it's very difficult for a pro, for a managed care company to push out somebody with the largest market share just because price is high so um, you know it definitely an academic medical center who does not have large market share then all of those other issues are much more important for them good well let's take our break now uh, we'll reconvene at 1045 to uh, have our second session thank you the first question I'm going to ask is actually what someone wrote on the question card. They were just uh, one question too early. Uh, but I want to talk about, uh, hey, could someone ask the people to come in from the, uh, okay. I want to talk about large employer benefit strategies and uh, begin with uh, uh, to what extent are large employers taking steps now to prepare for the Cadillac tax? Yeah, and I guess I would, um, you know, I would say I think there's a, a lot of conversation. Uh, I think everybody is aware of it. Uh, I think there's been a lot less in terms of uh, actual activity or conclusions from that. I, I think part of the issue there is that a lot of the employers most impacted by Cadillac tax also happen to have a lot of unions and collective bargaining. So it's not something that the uh, employers can just do unilaterally. It's something that has to be negotiated. Uh, and so that uh, you know slows the uh, the process down considerably. So I, I think there's a an understanding and there's conversation. Um, you know, not sure there's been really you know widespread uh, you know activity. Let me. I'm going to ask. Is, yeah. Hasn't that been one of the drivers on the the move towards high deductible plans? It's been employers sort of positioning themselves, particularly in the service industry, where maybe you don't have the, the unionization. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a thought. I guess the, yeah. you know, the point I would make is the, the growth that we've seen in high deductible plans, you know, this year or you know, sort of post the Cadillac tax, I wouldn't say has been considerably larger than the growth was, you know, in the years before Cadillac tax was introduced. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you've definitely seen a, a trend, and I think that's one of the, the factors. But you know, if, there were, if that was a really material driver, I would expect okay. to, to see a, a bigger increase. Yeah. And uh, what role do you think private exchanges will play? with employer-based coverage, either large or small employers. Um, you know, the, the news you read is that uh, how they're growing rapidly and are going to become a major part of the landscape. Uh, what do you think? I mean, it was, it was a, a hot topic last year when, when Walgreens made the choice and made the, the headlines, and it, it had certainly ramifications within the, uh, within the markets. Um, I think it's been quieter um, so far this year. You know, sure, there's been big growth, but it's, it's been big growth on a, on a very low base of people that have actually chosen uh, private exchanges. I think if you talk to most of the plans, they would tell you that interest level is very high, so a lot of employers are asking to see it, but the actual sort of pull-through of those making that decision has been relatively low at this point. Um, I, I certainly expect and would expect uh, private exchanges to continue to grow, um, again, off of a small base. I, you know, we're not necessarily in the camp of, of seeing some of the numbers or thinking that some of the projections are going to play themselves out in terms of, you know, 25, 30 percent of the market, you know, shifting over to private exchanges. We, we simply don't think that's going to happen. Um, and a, and a lot of it is just related to, um, you know, employers and their ability to sort of whether you believe they're, uh, you know, uh, able to sort of manage costs or collaborate more with uh, their existing insurance company. I think we've seen some level of successes, on, uh, you know, within that. So, um, you know, again, I expect some level of growth, but but I don't know that we're going to get to the level that um, some of the projections have, uh, have been put out. I would agree with that. Um, I, I would also just point out the fact that definitely going from a defined benefit to a defined contribution model and there's just going to be more costs uh, levied to the consumer as time goes on whether it be through private exchanges or some other medium of high deductibles etc yeah I'm, I'm not really a big believer in the in the private exchanges um, you know so I'd a cu couple things to uh, to think about so one is that it's not entirely clear what private exchanges do to lower the gr underlying growth in healthcare cost trend. Like, I, I understand how private exchanges push a lot of costs onto consumers, and, and that can have some benefits, um, but you know, there, there's no real um, you know, underlying. It, think about it in, in relation to if you can get providers to change the way they practice, you know, that can drive some pretty, pretty significant savings. 
Uh, yeah, so I think that that's one issue, and that's part of the reason why high deductible plans haven't grown the way everybody projected they would 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, because you get that year one uh, improvement in the cost trend, and then you know generally uh, high deductible cost trends grow, you know, in line with other healthcare inflation. Um, yeah, I think the second issue is at least as you think about the risk private exchange, so the model offered by Aon, uh, for a lot of employers it will cost them more to move to that risk private exchange with Aon than it would to stay self-funded. Uh, and the reason is that when you become fully insured, uh, you now pay the health insurance industry fee, you now pay state premium taxes, uh, you are subject to state mandated benefits, which you're exempt from as a, uh, a self-funded plan. So, you know, sort of 5 to 15 percent increase because of that. Uh, so when I talk to, uh, or I, I should say, having said all of that, I think private exchanges could be interesting for certain employers, low-wage, high-turnover workforces. Uh, you know, if you think about some of the marquee clients in Aon today, Sears, uh, Walgreens, Darden, which is a restaurant company, uh, you yeah, know, I think that makes sense for larger employers, um, you know, Higher work, higher paid workforces, less turnover. I think it's more of a challenge. So, like when, when I bring the idea to City's benefit manager, you know, what she'll say is, all right, well, first of all, it's going to cost us more. So I don't like that. Uh, second of all, the idea behind a private exchange is that you're going to give your employees a set amount of money. I'm going to give you three hundred dollars a month to buy your health insurance. Five years from now, I'm going to give you three hundred dollars a month to buy your health insurance. It's not going to increase. So I'm, as the employer, I'm capping my health care costs. If you are an employer like City, you know, one of the concerns you'd have is competitive workforce. If we start losing employees to Morgan Merrill Goldman and the CEO says we need to do a better job retaining people, well, one of the things that's going to be on the table is raising that health care contribution. So benefit manager would say, like, we're going to pay more up front, and we also don't have that certainty about the long-term cost because we very well could have to raise that contribution if the competitive ma market demands it. And we, we talked about the Cadillac tax before. It does really nothing to control that other than, again, pushing more costs onto the individual, but doesn't necessarily mean, you know, premiums aren't going to go, uh, aren't going to go higher at the end of the day. So, um, you know, from that perspective, it doesn't, it doesn't help. And it, it's, you know, to Carl's point, the other, the other angle of this is once you go risk, you have to pay somebody else. So beyond just the tax implications, it's just you're paying somebody else a profit, right? So think of it this way. For any for any self-funded organization, um, the the argument would be to pull in premiums that equal cost, right? In a in a perfect theoretical world, if I bring in a million dollars of healthcare premium, I want to have a million dollars of healthcare cost. Um, to the extent that that goes risk, all of a sudden that million dollars of premium needs to be a million fifty or a million one point one, whatever that incremental sort of margin opportunity is for that um, for that. A company taking on the risk. So I think once you add in all those elements, and I think sort of you peel back the onion a little bit, um, you know, sure, you can get savings. The savings, though, is not apples to apples uh, in some ways, to Carl's point. You know, it's just pushing more onto the consumer and pushing more consumers onto um, higher deductible plans is sort of the, the argument. And I think from a self-funded perspective, you know, you can do that now. You don't need to go through a private exchange, per se, to, to do that. Well, and I think the other thing, too, don't forget, is you've got HR departments, and if you're going to push them onto a private exchange, you've probably got employees in the HR department who spend a lot of time in terms of that benefit, and that, you know, you put them into the private exchange, it's, well, what do we need X, Y, and Z for, so. Yeah, one, one thing that I do think is interesting about private exchanges uh, is it does allow you to buy best in class by market. So, you know, as an example, City uses Aetna, it's our national ASO vendor. Um, Aetna is great in some markets from a unit cost perspective. They're not so good in other markets, but on average, they serve our needs its lowest cost. If you're in a private exchange, you, know, you can literally go market by market and pick the plan, or at least the employees can pick the plan that has the best unit cost in that market. So, you know, there there are some opportunities, um, you know, for private exchanges. Um, yeah. So I don't mean to say they're evil and they don't serve any purpose. Uh, you know, there, there are some. Uh, there are some benefits to them, you know, just broadly speaking, I think that the growth will be a lot slower than the, you know, some of what the consultants have projected. Yeah. So, Carl, for that model of just going, picking different plans, different areas, would that mean that uh, the city would have to go to a fully insured model, or, or is there a way you can get that through the self-insured? 
model. No, I mean you can you can do it through the self-funded model. It doesn't it doesn't have to be a a fully uh, insured model. Um, you know, so there there's you know, you know the uh, towers as an example. Uh, you know, their exchange I think to this point is predominantly uh, self-funded. So yeah. you know, there are there are ways to do that. Yeah. So I guess the the single carrier exchanges that you know you give up that potential to select by market. So. Is that just another way of outsourcing a little HR and uh, uh, getting more choices into your plan to go to a single carrier exchange? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, I, I'm not sure the the single carrier exchanges will. You know, I, I guess the point I make is single carrier exchanges are not that much different than what we're doing today. In mm -hmm. sense, yeah, we again we use Aetna and. Within Atna, we can pick a high deductible plan. We can pick the broad network PPO. We can pick the more limited network PPO. It's just really a variation. So it's just whether you call it an exchange or not. Right. Yeah. Good point. I want to talk about health plan and provider leverage. And first question is, uh, has there been a trend in uh, in the relative leverage between health plans and uh, and providers? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I think there there has been um, you know a, a little bit um, of, of a trend there. So I mean, my my underlying belief is hospitals always have the leverage, right? I mean, most people could care less whose insurance card they have. They care very much if they can't get into the academic medical center or, or the provider that's closest to them. You know, whoever happens to specialize in the in the disease that that you end up getting. Um, so I think hospitals always have the leverage. That being said, you have seen the unit prices that managed care companies paying to hospitals have come in. Um, you know, not by a huge amount, but it used to be we talk about providers getting five to seven percent price increases every single year, and now more common to see you know three to five. Um, I, I think part of that is that historically, when hospitals would come in and ask for fifty or hundred percent rate increases. Uh, oftentimes they would get those, uh, whereas today I think there's a uh, you know, much greater willingness on the part of the plans to, to push back against that, um, you know, even if it means going into a, uh, a public battle over it. Um, yeah, so I think that's been, been one nuance. But yeah, the unit, unit pricing for hospitals uh, you know, has, has come in a little bit. I would also add to that that on the contracting side, it seems like there's much more um, stipulations in the contracts around quality metrics. They're definitely starting to slip in and, and, and be uh, uh, tied to those uh, rate increases. Mm -hmm. and, and I also think that um, I think employers are getting in the fray as well. Um, you know, to Carl's point, I think there was an acceptance over time of, and, and I would argue, I don't know that managed care really did a good job historically of truly managing cost. It, it was really a pass through element, right? It was, I need to give my hospital guys seven, eight, nine percent rate increases, so I need a 10 percent rate increase to sort of make that spread for myself. And it was, a, um, you know, everybody was sort of happy, if you will. Um, you know, margins were, um, you know, were, were fair and, and on a higher premium dollar amount. So, you know, I think as, as employers have started to sort of push back and as the system started to push back, that's why we arguably have reform, um, you, you know, I think more employers are getting into the mix unwilling to, um, you know, give those levels of price increases. So it's set up a, a pressure point across the, uh, you know, across the system and across networks. Yeah, and that, I just add along with that, I think because Medicare sort of sets the tone, realistically, I think that on the provider side, there's a realization that you can't, you can't have high single digit rate increases, you know, just ongoing on your commercial side, given where Medicare is going. So I think there's a realization that they need to, to work with um, insurers and, and employers in terms of, of reining in those costs over time. Yeah, often I hear about there's more pressure on plans from employers against premium increases. And although, you know, it, it's one thing to just ask for it, it you know, it's not clear to me how the pressure is actually applied. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say, I mean, em employers have very, very little leverage um, in terms of their rate negotiations with, with managed care companies. So if you think about all of your largest employers, you know, the cities, and uh, you know, they're all self-funded, so there is no negotiation. Uh, you know, when you look at the, quote, large group market that the health plans serve, a, a very significant portion of that large group market is employers that have 51 to 250 employees. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of leverage. Um, so, 
you know, if you're a state government that happens to be fully insured or a municipality, yeah, okay, then, then you, you do have some leverage. That's a marquee account that somebody else would be willing to, uh, you know, to come in to try to build some scale in that market. Uh, but, you know, I think in, in, in many cases, em employers, uh, you know, don't necessarily have a, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of le leverage other than putting an RFP out and hoping that they get a, uh, you know, more, than, more than one response. But I think also, again, from the provider side, what employers can do is shift more of that, that increased cost onto their employees, whether it's through larger deductibles or through cost sharing in terms of shifting that premium increase onto, onto their employees. And I think over the long term, again, providers understand that that's a losing battle over the long term because people are, are getting more price sensitive and, and scratching their head. And, and as they're absorbing more of that cost increase, trying to understand why it's why it's going up. And so I think over the long term, they understand that political pressure among people who are their patients and in their communities. Good. Um, you know, in Washington, you hear a lot about whether ACO contracting by Medicare is going to inevitably lead to greater provider leverage with private plans. And so from your understanding of healthcare markets, how significant is that concern? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think there is a, yeah, I mean, a couple couple different angles to think about. So, you know, one is that in conjunction with all this you've seen going on, you have hospitals uh, buying up physician groups or employing physicians to a more significant extent. Uh, physicians have historically had very little negotiating leverage with managed care companies. So, you know, it would seem to make sense to me that, you know, from a hospital's perspective, uh, you know, you are now going to... Uh, jointly negotiate. So if you're a high-powered hospital in a market, why aren't you negotiating your physician rates along with your hospital unit costs uh, to try to give those physicians, uh, you know, some more leverage? Uh, you know, there's also situations where, you know, physicians that were previously billing an outpatient rate uh, when they get acquired by the physician can now bill an inpatient rate. And, you know, same procedure, just getting a, uh, you know, a higher level of reimbursement. Um, from from that, uh, so I think there are some some angles to uh, to think about. You know, somewhat unrelated. It's interesting to me. Uh, AHIP, the uh, health insurance industry group, has made a really really big public relations push over the last year about how provider consolidation drives up costs. What's interesting about it is I've never heard the managed care CEOs be more vocal about wanting to go out and do their own acquisitions. Um, so big, large-scale consolidation uh, in the health insurance industry. So just kind of an interesting that, uh, you know, they're putting as much focus on consolidation drives up prices when we could be on the, you know, the cusp of seeing some, some pretty sizable managed care acquisitions. Good. Um, the, uh, actually, you got us into hospital employment of physicians, and the first question I had is uh, how much further will the trend go? Uh, you know, will say in five or ten years, where we'll be at the point where most communities, the majority of physicians are employed by hospitals, or is this trend you know, somehow going to be limited after a while? Uh, I think it definitely continues. I think that uh, if you looked uh, a couple years ago, physicians that were being uh, purchased were uh, specialists, and now it's primarily primary care, and they're trying to protect their source of income, which is uh, people in beds. And if you are the gatekeeper to the primary care physician and they refer you to the hospital, it just flows right to the P&L. So I, I think that that definitely is going to continue. I think that it's, um, in one sense, uh, a defensive mechanism, because if the hospital across the street is buying up the doctors, then you also have to buy them up. Otherwise, you know, again, they're going to shift where those patients ultimately go. So it's both an aggressive uh, and a, a defensive mechanism. Yeah, I think it's a, I agree. I think it's a trend that's going to continue. I think we've, we've kind of gotten through maybe uh, where, you, where you saw a lot of hospitals going out and acquiring physicians. It, it, and it obviously depends on each marketplace. But I think you've seen a lot of consolidation that's taken place. I think you're going to continue to see that trend. But Right now, with the pressures on hospitals, I think depending on who those specialist groups are, clearly primary care is an area where they still have a lot of interest. But I think, you know, hospitals 
with the decline in inpatient volumes that's expected to continue, I think, on the specialist side, um, depending on how, how competitive that market is, how important that group is to your organization, I think there's other ways that they can align physicians, whether it's through IT, whether it's providing business services in terms of running their practices. But I think what also is happening is you're seeing sort of a generational difference. You know, the older physicians that are um, independent physicians are beginning to, you know, reach retirement age. The younger physicians coming out of medical school from, from the surveys that have been done greatly prefer uh, the employed uh, physician model. And so I think you'll begin, that's another thing that's at, uh, at work here. So I think over time you're going to see more and more physicians that will be employed by health systems. Yeah, I would say the, the limiting factor to it will be that while it's fun to talk about buying in physicians and all the you know, good things that can come of it, you actually have to execute on that. Uh, so as a specific example, you're taking a doctor who previously earned based on what they did, uh, and now you're putting that doctor on salary. So, you know, does that mean that, you know, golf goes from two days to three days? Um, so, you know, from the, from the hospital perspective, you know, I think that would be the limiting factor is they invest all this money in buying up physicians and then realize they're not getting the financial benefit from it that they thought they did because the doctor productivity goes down. Yeah, well, that was actually going to be my next question is about how are the hospitals doing now as far as, uh, you know, using the physicians they're employed effectively, you know, both on productivity dimension, on, uh, you know, generating more admissions and referrals, or down the road, you know, coordinating care, pursuing population health. I mean, yeah, it's it's a race to the dock right now, but um, that race isn't isn't turning out so profitable for most hospitals. I think um, you know certainly some of the publicly traded have talked about you know losing money um, you know on those physician practices, and it takes a while to um, either turn them around or we'll have to see if they turn it around. Now, some of it's how you define you know the profitability to just define it as it relates to sort of the the practice in and of itself of what you bought um, and the bottom line results of that practice versus sort of intertwining that practice with um, your general sort of ad admission and, and, and hospital trends as well. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's largely been a losing proposition, but to Nick's point, I think many hospitals have been, you know, defensive in trying to go after the docs largely because um, other hospitals in the market have been doing it and they don't want to be left, uh, you know, left behind. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is, I mean, we've seen this a few years back and it all failed. Uh, when you talk to the hospitals today about what you're doing differently, they'll tell you that the contracts are much more performance-based and there's penalties, but time will tell if that actually plays out. Um, that, that would be point number one. But point number two, uh, you also see, you know, uh, take a tenant, for example, they have a performance initiative, they used to call it Medicare Performance Initiative, and, and health systems always had a difficult time telling the doctors what to do especially from the administrative side to the doctors. You know, take a hike. I'll, I'm the doctor. I'll, I'll care for my patient the way they want uh, or the way I want to care for them. But uh, they actually had a, a, it's a pretty interesting chart, and it, it shows, you know, for XYZ DRG, here's what the national average cost is. Here's what this hospital's cost is. And then it ranks all the doctors. And, and doctors are inherently competitive. So once a doctor sees that they're, you know, the, the last guy in line and everybody's picking on them in the lunchroom, they're going to start to change their ways because it's not really the hospital administrator saying, you know, you're not doing this right. It's, well, wait a minute, uh, doctor down the end of the table here is doing a much better job. I've, you know, I can't look like the, uh, the, the slow poke at the end of the line. So you're seeing some innovative ways in which they're trying to interact. But again, we'll ultimately see if to Carl's point, golf goes from two days to three days. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think the difference this time is they're putting performance metrics in there. And I think what we hear a lot is when they're employed, it's much easier to sort of drive clinical change, which hospitals will tell you is where they're going to be able to reduce costs, unit costs. So for example, physician preference items when they're employed and, and you get the surgeons in a room together um, and tell them how much certain items cost, a lot of them, when they were independent, didn't care. They wanted to come in, they wanted their items. Now that they're part of the overall hospital and, and part of their compensation is going to be in terms of having that either clinical line or, or turning over that OR and giving them some input in terms of 
what the cost of things are, you're beginning to see those physician preference items, for example, instead of having seven, eight, nine, ten, they're coming down to three or four, which is helping on the supply side. Good. And one more question. Carl had mentioned before that hospitals that employed physicians were getting higher payment rates for physician services. Question to the panel is, what about hospital rates? Does a hospital that, um, you know, employs a lot of physicians, is that, is that in a position to get higher hospital rates as well? I think that's hard to tell. I yeah. think uh, it really comes down to market share. And you look at the, the largest health systems out there, they're the ones generally driving the, the getting the best rates for managed care just simply because they have the market share. And yeah, I think there's quality and whatnot um, that gets you there. So you could paint a picture where you have a hospital with poor quality ratings, they buy all the physicians, and then they work with those docs to improve quality, and then does that translate to a higher rate down the road? Sure, but uh, I don't think that's driving the main driver of, of rates. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is either. I mean, if the if the if the physicians had that much clout, um, they they probably have that clout on a on a standalone basis too, and probably wouldn't even want to partner with the uh, with the hospitals. Yeah, I, I don't have a specific example for you, but you could think of a, a general example where, again, coming back to joint negotiate joint negotiations between the, the physicians and the hospitals, you can think of a scenario where a hospital wants a ten percent rate increase and managed care says five, and the hospital says, well, yeah. That's fine, but if you don't agree to this 10%, we control 70% of the anesthesiologists in this market. They will no longer contract with you. Um, so, I mean, I get you could theoretically come up with a scenario, you know, something along those lines, where they use it to push up hospital rates. But, like I said, I don't have a don't have a great specific example where where that's happened. Good. Um, a question about uh, insurer initiatives to slow the. Uh, uh, the trend of hospital uh, employment of physicians. Uh, you know, how, how extensive are initiatives either to pay primary care physicians more in conjunction with, say, patient-centered medical homes or buying practices, employing physicians, or doing things to facilitate the formation of physician organizations? Is that something you just hear about at the cutting edge, or is this more significant or broader? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very incremental. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, you have certain examples where uh, managed care companies, uh, you know, have gotten into the physician business, but that's been very limited to companies that have a retail presence. So you're focused on Medicare or the individual business. You know, the, pr the problem with a managed care company that serves large employers owning physicians is that no managed care company will ever employ enough physicians to satisfy an account like Citigroup. We have 100,000 people. Like, you know, how many doctors do Citigroup employees use? Like, no one's going to have a, uh, you know, any network physician group that's that's big enough to handle that. You know, if you're just serving individuals, uh, you know, then conceivably, you know, it, it, it does make more sense. Uh, yeah, you know, there's been you know some initiatives, uh, you know, to pay primary care doctors. So, uh, you know, Care First, uh, somewhat locally, has or, you know locally has uh, has done some. Uh, patient-centered medical homes with much higher uh, primary care reimbursement. Uh, so there are some initiatives out there, but, um, you know, couldn't point to anything that's, uh, that's really widespread. Good. You know, one thought I've had in, in absorbing the discussions of the panel for a long time is that contrast between what you hear from consultants, who are always talking about these phenomenal new things that are going to take <laughs> over, and what you hear from these equity and bond analysts who are much more sober and much more nuanced about, well, what's, heck, you know, what's the magnitude of this? So, uh, you know, really good comments. Uh, the uh, question, we've gotten into this a little bit before, and, uh, but, you know, any other things you have to say about the, you know, the combined or net effect of various Affordable Care Act impacts on hospital margins? Uh, you know, like more paying patients, but many at discounted rates, um, and some states not having expanded Medicaid. Um, anything beyond what you've said before? No, I mean, I think from, from a hospital margin standpoint, it's, um, I think probably the benefit of the Affordable Care Act has just been, <clears throat> it's, 
I think it brought together, you know, insurers, hospitals, <clears throat> you know, device makers, and I think at least on the hospital side and the not-for-profit side, <clears throat> my sense is is that they, I think this time is is different. They understand that as as you look at the you know the long-term projections in terms of what Medicare is funded at and the the population, I think that they really have taken it upon themselves to try and work to, you know, to to slow that that cost growth and and so. There's a lot of things that they're trying out there, they're dipping their toe into to see what works and what doesn't. Clearly, you know, they've got to, they've got to maintain a bottom line, but I think that they've taken it more on, taken it upon themselves to, to look at, um, you know, how can we better can control costs? How can we um, really look at our work processes, our clinical processes um, to improve those? I think the you know the incentive on IT has been a real game changer. I think if you look at healthcare relative to other industries, you know the adoption of IT has been come very very late. Uh, it's still very fragmented, but I think that the information that they're getting out of there, the clinical data, is is allowing them to um, to identify best practices. You know, it's like Nick said when when physicians before when hospitals were acquiring physicians, they had no way to to determine who was providing good clinical care and who wasn't. Now they're actually able to get the data uh, to be able to, to see who's providing quality outcomes, you know, at a lower cost and then be able to identify those practices and, and then move those through the system. I, I would just say, I mean, we, we've seen some level of, of margin bump, um, I think that's fair to say, within the publicly traded um, arena, which, again, most of the industry, 80% of the industry is not for profit. So, um, you know, Jim could probably allude more to, to sort of the margin profiles there. You know, we've seen some bump. I, I would argue, I don't know that it's been sort of an outlandish type of, uh, of increase to this point. Um, and the argument, I think, for most of the hospitals is that, um, you know, clearly you know, that the uninsured was on sort of their backs for, um, you know, a number of years. And what we're getting to in terms of some of the, um, you know, some of the improvement here is more of a normalization of where things arguably should have been historically, as opposed to, um, you know, some windfall opportunity for, for the hospitals, because we all know pressures will continue kind of going forward. And so there is going to be more consolidation. I think there is going to be, um, you know, a lot more hospital closures kind of going forward once things normalize. So um, I don't know that we should view this, um, you know, as some outlandish sort of margin pop within the hospital industry, um, as opposed to some level of normalization for a population base that, um, you know, hasn't historically, has historically paid zero. Yeah, I'd also just comment on that and say, when you look at a, a hospitals p l one of the things you need to remember is that it's such a fixed cost leveraged model that any incremental benefit from somebody showing up that is a some pay rather than a no pay all flows right through to the bottom line so you know when we look at the impact uh, on the, the statements and and if we really want to get granular you you really have to parse through what's going on in terms of the revenue recognition and in terms of the bad debts to, to kind of figure out what that benefit is. But, um, you know, every incremental person that uses, uh, you know, hospitals have gotten much more efficient over the past few years in terms of staffing levels, in terms of supply costs, in terms of consolidating vendor contracts. So now as you're starting to see the benefit of uh, you know, being at a trough level of utilization as it starts to tick up, it, it looks a little bit larger than it is just because it's a, such a fixed cost model now. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, I'd like to probe on this cost issue that, uh, and after I've maligned consultants, let me <laughs> say that I uh, was talking with someone who's, who's quite prominent uh, who just mentioned that uh, he's been seeing more large hospital systems embarking on ambitious long-term initiatives to reduce costs than he's than has been the case before in his memory and uh, uh, I was wondering if this if particularly Jim if you've mm -hmm. seen something like this and, uh, and 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 after that just elaborating more on some of the things you were saying before about well you know what are the tools that hospitals are using to address costs well, I was going to say, I was recently at a conference with 20 of the largest not-for-profit health systems, and they did a survey, and they said, you know, what are your, 
what are your biggest concerns or what's your biggest emphasis in consumerism, physician alignment, and it was cost containment was number one. And so, um, you know, that is where the focus is um, in, in as they look at, okay, how are we going to reduce our unit costs? I think one of the ways that they've done it is through consolidation. I mean, I think, um, you know, um, economies of scale, um, adding uh, organizations where you can spread sort of those those fixed costs across a larger um, a larger revenue base you're seeing that in the not-for-profit space I think that's one of the things the for-profits have you know have been able to to use to their advantage they've generally been much larger in terms of the number of hospitals and revenues and they tend to run very thin in terms of the the shared service or corporate overhead um, so on the not-for-profit space that consolidation is providing benefit I think some of the other things, it's a lot of small things, blocking and tackling. It's consolidating supply or vendor relationships and, and looking at supply costs. It's a lot of time being spent on, on revenue cycle, making sure that uh, in terms of coding and what they're getting paid is, is appropriate. Um, you know, I think that the other area that we're seeing is this whole idea of cl clinical redesign and really looking at, okay, um, you know, how do we, <clears throat> If we look at our different clinical service lines, how are we going to be able to provide those services more efficiently? And so I think it's a, it's a, uh, a wide variety of small things that together are providing them an ability to better control costs. I, I would just add that there's definitely a lot more collaboration between uh, hospitals and GPOs mm -hmm. and physicians, um, conversations with medical device companies to uh, you know, enhance the products that are out there and, and, and make those more efficient to reduce cost. And then you know, by doing that, they're reducing the number of stents in the OR from mm -hmm. 10 different vendors to two. And, and they're really collaborating with the two that they have. So, I, I think the focus on, on cost is directly relatable to top line pressures that I think all hospitals see, um, and even more so kind of moving forward, um, you know, on, on price specifically. Price goes straight to the bottom line. Incremental volume has costs associated with it. So to the extent that pressures going forward will be more on the pricing side, which in, inevitably it will be, hospitals just have to become more efficient. So the focus on cost is really, you know, sort of a survival tactic, I think, you know, moving forward, because I don't know a lot of hospitals out there that really believe that, you know, they're going to be able to generate um, you know, any significant top line or, and or um, as we move away from fee-for-service and, and value-based, um, you know, purchasing, et cetera, that, uh, you know, that they're going to be able to sort of sustain the level of top line that's needed to, uh, you know, continue to grow, uh, grow earnings. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things, you know, in terms of the emphasis on clinical quality, we've seen with a lot of the hospitals that we rate the, you know, their, um, their insurance costs, so their, their uh, liability costs, you've seen that come down pretty dramatically, and that's, that's provided uh, some, some savings in terms of what they're spending on insurance costs. Their Is that liability. because they're really reducing errors? Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I was going to say that, you know, that's been um, a, a strong area of, of, of benefit. Obviously, there are some things that, that they've been able to, that have been beneficial, our concern from a rating standpoint is, you know, you, you sort of pick the low-hanging fruit, and in terms of, of continuing to get cost reductions, some of those things, I think the, um, you, you know, the ability to continue to reduce costs in those areas, it's going to be, there's a marginal, uh, a smaller return there. And so I think then you really got to get at the clinical design and, and clinical practice patterns. Good. Well, to follow up on this optimism about uh, more significant attention to cost is, you know, a question that gets asked here in Washington often, which is, you know, the Medicare hospital cuts uh, in the Affordable Care Act that start in 2017, uh, the issue has been, uh, will these be sustainable, in a sense? Can hospitals, uh, you know, get their costs down, you know, like increasing their productivity 1% a year? Uh, do you have any sense of whether that's going to be feasible to sustain for more than a few years? Well, specifically as it relates to the dish cuts, uh, it, it all depends on the, the the level of uninsured. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, that's a separate question, but and that's a good one. 
is that clearly that was, you could say, calibrated to reducing the numbers of uninsured and, you know, the uneven Medicaid expansions have certainly thrown a monkey wrench into that. But I guess the, the national issue is really going to depend on ultimately a few years down the road, how many uninsured do we have? Well, yeah. I, I think that's going to be a determining factor as when CMS evaluates rates. Uh, you know, if the level of uninsured hasn't come down, it's going to be a lot harder for them to reduce rates mm -hmm. uh, if they don't want to sacrifice on, on the quality side. Now I see why you're bringing that up. Mm -hmm. I, I just think I just think all the hospitals, certainly in the publicly traded realm, if, when you ask them sort of what the expectation is around Medicare rate increases going forward, I don't I don't know that anybody expects it to sort of keep in line with sort of core medical inflation. So I think most of the mindset for the hospitals, again going back to sort of the cost argument, is you know how do we continue to operate when pricing on let's call it 40%, if not more, of our business on the on the both Medicare and Medicaid side are basically essentially flat, and arguably you don't have the type of leverage that you've had historically with managed care as it relates to funding or helping to subsidize the uninsured. And so you know, you're trying to balance all that. So from a, from a standpoint of the hospital side, I think most in their budgets going forward are assuming if I could just get – um, zero to up as opposed to down on the Medicare side, I've got to, that's, that's my operating model going forward, plus sort of a managed care rate increase of, I don't know, three to five, four to six um, in that range to the extent that I can do that. I think that's the operating model that has to work to the extent that you can't get that to work from a cost perspective. You're not going to be in business that much longer. Yeah, so it sounds like the they're taking this very seriously, and they're, they have a model that they're going to try to follow to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And again, a lot of that, I think, you know, we're even seeing, I mean, greater sort of outsourcing as a, as a good example of, of that. You know, more and more hospitals looking to, you know, outsource certain things, um, you know, and not pay, right? So, um, you know, and bundling some of the out, out, outpatients or, or um these uh, outsourced services. So whether it's ED staffing, anesthesiology, NICU, um, hospitalist, all these programs that I think historically they've paid for with no essential return, I think there's a more, you know, and sort of greater willingness to outsource that to somebody else, whether there's a JV structure and or just outsource that and have somebody else um, deal with that sort of physician component of it. I think you're seeing some of that um, happening as well in terms of hospitals trying to become more efficient with things that historically have been money losers for them. Yeah, Jim, what's your perspective? Can hospitals actually sustain those, those type of Medicare uh, rate increases? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's, I think there's going to become an inflection point at which point, you know, politically it's going to be very difficult to hold Medicare at, at just a, a zero rate increase. I think as you look at the, the aging of the population and you know, we've always felt that from a political standpoint, you know, as everybody knows, it's easy to talk about cuts in a broad sense, but once it starts hitting the local hospitals, uh, I saw an interesting map that uh, hospital employment or medical uh, health care employment in the United States, if you go through, and I can't remember how many states, but it was the vast majority of states, it's the largest employer, um, employs more people in states than, than a map that you looked at 30 years ago. And so, you know, there, there are public policy questions in regards to how much can you cut, whether it's uh, to hospitals um, and uh, what impact that's going to have. I think the other thing is, is how, how well can Medicare control costs rather in, in terms of controlling care, end-of-life care, as we know, is where a lot of the, the monies are spent, and that's uh, for the Medicare population. And you can't, until you sort of get to that and, and begin to change those behaviors, um, it's going to be really difficult to have a meaningful impact in terms of what we're spending on the Medicare side. The only thing I'd say is I think there's two, two sort of arguments here. One is, um, you know, how are hospitals approaching this and what's actually going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think from a hospital perspective, <laughs> anything more than, you know, if you're basing your operating budget going forward that you're going to get three, four percent rate increase from Medicare, um, you know, maybe at some point you do, um, but, you know, if that's where your game plan is um, or your budget is, you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure point, you know, sort of early on. So I think most are, are sort of 
preparing for the worst and essentially hoping for, you yeah. know, hoping for the best. Good. Um, let me change the topic now. Uh, you know, we have a lot of demonstrations going on in some states of, uh, ma of managed care for dual eligibles. And I was wondering if any of you are familiar with this and could answer, you know, how prepared are managed care plans for the challenges of this population that is new to them and the greater scope of long-term services and supports as well as acute care? Yeah, I guess um, so. The, the dual demonstration has been interesting from the perspective that the company's best position to win the business and get into it are Medicaid plans. Um, that's partly because certain states are only giving dual business to existing Medicaid plans, so California would be one. Um, it's also because in the states that do RFPs, those RFPs are generally done by the state Medicaid agency, and so there's just a lot more familiarity with the Medicaid players. They're used to submitting RFP responses, um, you know, th things like that. Um, you know, that said, you can make an argument that it's really the Medicare plans that are better equipped to actually care for that population. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's been sort of interesting as some of these things have rolled out. Uh, you know, I would say, by and large, none of the plans are, are all that equipped to do long-term support services. Uh, it's something that they've never really done, uh, at least to any significant extent uh, previously. So too early uh, with most of these rollouts to have a, a real definitive answer, but I think probably the most uh, pressing policy question right now is that the opt-out rates um, you know, for, for many of these dual demonstrations have been extremely high. Uh, so Los Angeles, uh, as of last month, was a 50% opt-out rate. Uh, it did come down to 40% uh, for the uh, for the ne November data, uh, but if that opt-out rate continues to run at that level, then yeah, I think it's going to you know, raise a lot of policy questions about you know, how effective this uh, really was if you have you know, 40 to 50 percent of the people choosing not to participate. Yeah, and what what would you say are the critical managed care skills that you know most potentially brought to bear on this population? The implication that those skills sure. would likely be more possessed by the, the Medicare plans. Yeah, so um, just from the perspective that the, the Medicare plans are used to dealing with a sicker population that has a lot of health needs, um, whereas that's generally not the business of a traditional Medicaid managed care vendor. Yeah. Uh, but what, what they can bring to bear is just all the things managed care is supposed to do, care coordination. So, uh, you know, as a couple of examples, you know, there's all kinds of rules about if you get discharged from an inpatient facility, where you go, into what setting for post-acute care, uh, and the various reimbursement schemes um, you know, that you get. A lot of times those decisions aren't made on what's best for the patient, they're made on revenue maximization. Um, so you can, you can smooth some of that out. Uh, you know, I think there's lots of situations where people end up in settings that they don't need to be in. Um, but there's no way to, to fix it in the current system. So a specific example may be exaggerated, but somebody moves into a nursing home, not because they need to be in the nursing home, but because they've got stairs in their house and they just can't get up the stairs anymore. So managed care company can make the decision that putting in one of those chair lifts might cost $10,000 to make a number up versus you know, annual expenses in a nursing home might be twenty-five dollars or $35,000. So you know, clear financial benefit to you know, put that in uh, as opposed to moving somebody to a nursing home. In the current system, it's not like you can submit a code for chairlift. Um. Good. Um, and let me change the topic again to hospital construction plans and uh, you know, how, how is the current market environment affecting hospital construction? Uh, and are you more concerned with overcapacity or shortages of capacity over the next few years? Well, I think in the, the not-for-profit space, we've seen capital spending come down in terms of inpatient capacity. I think a lot of organizations, again, from an efficiency standpoint, they've, they're looking at how can we, how can we best use and, and operate more efficiently within our, within our inpatient walls right now. I think as you look at the technology, more and more is going into the outpatient space. It's lower cost in terms of development and, and construction. I think the, the other thing is, is um, you know, as as health systems are building out uh, their systems, I think they they want to improve their access points. And so, whether it's putting physician offices out into the community, putting outpatient capacity out into the community, making you know uh, making that ease of access greater, 
and really looking to drive more high acuity stuff into their into their inpatient facilities right now is is what we hear a lot of and so I guess what I would say is is over the near term I think that the inpatient capacity is is sufficient in fact I think depending on which markets you're looking in there's probably an overcapacity of, of inpatient space right now I would I would agree on that front um, I would also say that it's it's interesting to note as we see a lot of the consolidation in the industry there um, there's been acquisitions at fairly low multiples but with fairly high uh, aggressive capex plans so a lot of the smaller non-for-profits don't like to see the for-profits coming into town they think they're these big bad guys and and in in reality one, one of the ways in which they're 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 breaking that barrier down and saying hey look at you know we we get that you're one of the largest employers in the county and whatnot we'll not only purchase the facility but we'll upgrade uh you know whether it be the the front of the house or whether it be in the emergency room whether whether it be in the the ors etc so we're seeing that we're also seeing a lot of the capex as in dollars spent uh on the outpatient side these days does that apply lower CapEx overall, at least on the construction side, when you know there's movement from inpatient to outpatient, is the net less investments? Uh, you know, I, I would say we've seen probably if so we look at sort of capital spending as a percentage of depreciate. We've seen that come down, but it's been in other areas. I mean, IT has been a huge area of capital expenditure, and it's probably going to continue to be that way for a while going on, but in terms of bricks and mortar, we're seeing inpatient bricks and mortar, seeing that that uh, I think has trended down pretty significantly. Yeah, I agree on the bricks and mortar yeah. part. It'll also be interesting to see what happens in the next year or so in terms of hospital capex spending because margins have gotten a boost from coming off the trough levels of utilization and the benefit from a reduction in the uninsured. And now that there is some extra money there and they're not spending it on getting certified for meaningful use, that there could be more spending in terms of beds, pumps, all your other ancillary uh, products that go along uh, with, with caring for the patient. So that'll be something very interesting to watch in the next year or so. Good. I've got some questions about primary care physician supply. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of expectations that uh, of shortages in light of expanded insurance coverage and the expanded roles for primary care practitioners that uh, you know some of the evolved delivery systems envision um, what's your sense of how this is sorting out is this is primary care physician shortages a real barrier to um, access or to actually implementing some of the delivery reforms I mean, I mean, going into reform, I, I thought we would hear more. Um, it's been kind of quiet on that front um, in terms of, you know, complaints from individuals not being able to access, um, you know, doctors and, and physicians. So either it's happening and it's not being brought to the forefront or maybe it's been either overstated or we haven't, you know, hit that sort of breaking point of, of physicians. Maybe uh, the other side of it as well is that, you know, we did have uh, payment par Medicare, uh, Medicaid payment parity where your Medicaid rate got boosted up to Medicare. Um, that's expiring at the end of this year. So, you know, I, I just, you know, you wonder if that doesn't get extended, whether or not we hear more noise from physicians maybe unwilling to see, um, you know, Medicaid in, in terms of keeping their uh, offices open for more of the commercial and, and Medicare side of things. No, I think uh, on that point, front you know parity is very important because a lot of these primary care docs if they're not if the money's not there they're not going to be there I mean they're there there's a profit motive there as well other than just ethics of, of taking care of people so that's point number one I would also say point number two you know a lot of just as a longer term bigger picture item a lot of physicians are generally entrepreneurial competitive people and with employment of physicians with you know, uh, somebody presenting in the, the emergency room and they have to follow a cookie cutter menu of procedures rather than getting to practice medicine the way in which they want. Those are all hinder you know, kids coming in to, uh, out of college deciding whether or not they want to go into medicine. So that's also something to think about. But, um, you know, one of the issues with primary care is it's not really a a sexy industry to be in. I mean, you're okay. I'm gonna 
I mean, don't get me wrong. Some people love it and they do very well, at it, but it's not, you know, people are, are more attracted towards the specialist fields. Um, and, and until you can kind of get people more excited about primary care, you're going to have somewhat of a shortage over there. Well, and I think the other thing that, that we hear a lot is that it's, it's the uh, making sure the incentives in primary care meet what, what the goals are. So right now, you know, as we were talking about with physicians, they're still volume-based and RVU-based. And, and, you know, we hear a lot about getting primary care physicians to work at the top of their license. And so how can you uh, expand that panel size, whether it's through nurse practitioners and MAs and case managers, so y you can essentially leverage that primary care physician's uh, ability to touch more patients? And, and what things are they doing that really they don't need to be doing on their license? You know, that's a good transition into my next question, which is, uh, you know, have you seen much activity as far as states or private insurers, uh, Medicaid plans, uh, to actually ease policies concerning nurse practitioners and other mid-levels in order to increase primary care supply? Is this going to be a, a big response of, uh, to the lack of attractiveness of primary care of, you know, pulling more lesser trained people into it? Personally, I think that you've seen a lot of this already with the, the minute clinics of the world and the, the express doctor clinics where a lot of times you don't even have a primary care uh, doctor in there. It's a nurse practitioner. And you know, consumers seem to be liking those uh, facilities for care just given uh, how they're uh, – <laughs> there's now a line at them actually <laughs> close to where I live. So uh, I, I don't see – I don't see them, insurers, public or private, uh, really working to, to hinder those uh, access uh, points to care. Maybe that's the reason that Ralph hasn't seen much, many complaints about primary care shortages because there are so many other places to go today. Good. Uh, I think we're getting to time for your questions. And, uh, yeah, if you want to just get the microphone, that'd be great to start. Others can write on their cards. Oh, actually, does that, where's the microphone? I'd like to get this recorded on the webcast. Two questions. I'm Julie Cantor Weinberg with the College of American Pathologists. So part of this question won't surprise you. Yep, we haven't talked at all this morning about the changing diagnostics markets, both from the perspective of the legislation, PAMA legislation last year that dramatically cut reimbursement as well as the growth of gen genomics and companion diagnostics. And then two, talked a little bit about HIT, but there's been a lot written in town on the churn of the meaningful use program. We haven't talked about the impact on, on vendors and you know, assuming there's a stage three, that people will have to upgrade their systems. I'll tackle the second question first. Uh, in, in terms of what we're seeing with the health IT companies right now, there, there, a few years ago the whole push was meaningful use, and that was the buzzword, and it was a land grab to, to who could get the most uh, facilities using their prop, uh, product. In terms of going forward, uh, with the, the two big buzzwords and themes there these days is, is primarily population health and they're essentially trying to put a stake in the ground uh, with the ACO uh, models and, and accountable care uh, to essentially say that in order for you to operate this ACO, you really need our products because we have the analytics that you need and uh, versus having to go to a health insurance company where they'll give you everything. So you're, you're seeing that um, on that front. And then, you know, it's, hey, uh, ICD-10 is coming. Well, you have to upgrade to the next version of our software because if you don't, you know, it's not compatible. So um, I, I think you'll continue to, to see them price that way. And, and uh, uh, you know, they're going to try to take advantage of any type of, you know, whether it be ICD-10, whether it be Pop Health, so that they can price to those uh, um, themes in the market because meaningful use is, is basically gone at this point. 
But I think the investment in IT is going to continue. You know, what we hear a lot is, is organizations probably 20, 20, 25 percent of their capital budget has been sort of carved out for IT spending. And I think that, you know, that's an area that they can, they, hospitals, whether, whether or not they get reimbursed from meaningful use is an area that they're going to continue, they feel that they continue to have to invest in going forward. Good. I've got a question here that uh, provider slash hospital cost reduction initiatives, um, have you observed that uh, a difference in cost reduction between providers or systems with greater market share, uh, i.e. negotiating clouds, versus those with lower market shares. I think I get this is that are you seeing the cost reduction activities concentrated more in the providers that have less market power? I think if you have larger market share, you're generally a larger provider to begin with, right? So you have more resources. So, you know, you look at hospital staffing levels, they're they're real time now. I mean you're tapping nurses on the shoulder at lunchtime telling them to go home because there's just not enough volume in the system right now for you to, to justify being there. So, um, you know, versus a smaller two, three, four hospital system uh, in rural America, they don't have the sophisticated uh, programs and systems in place to, to do that. I think where everybody is benefiting is on the supply cost side because everybody, is, everybody does contract with the GPL and the GPOs do have a lot of clout in terms of buying power. And you see that with uh, medical device companies talking about, well, price is going to be down 1% this year. Oh, now it's going to be down 2 And then you hear them talking about, you know, certain um, commodity items like knees and hips, and you have mid-single-digit pricing declines that you occasionally hear them talk about. And it just goes to show you that, that the systems are really trying to uh, control what they can, and uh, I think they're definitely doing it on the supply and labor cost side. Yeah, and I'd agree. I mean, I, I, I don't think you're seeing the smaller hospitals that may need to, to, to cut more being able to. I think, I think, again, cost containment, whether you're a large system, whether you're a, uh, you know, a national system, that is, is where the focus is. I do think that the, the larger systems, just due to their, their size, their scale, the, the the depth of their management, their their information systems, probably are in a much better position to drive cost containment. And and in the not-for-profit space, that's why you're seeing a lot of consolidation. You're seeing small independent hospitals sort of understanding that it's you know it's just more and more difficult to compete if you don't have that size and scale again, where you can spread some of those costs across a much larger uh, revenue base and and across a unit basis. Yeah. So an interpretation of what both of you have said is that. Really, all hospitals are looking hard to cut costs, but the larger ones are perhaps better positioned to do it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi, I'm Mary. It's Carrie with Kaiser Health News. And I just want to ask you an ACA-related question. We're hearing a lot in Washington about a push for this medical device tax repeal that's in the ACA. If that were to pass and if the president were to sign it, I know those are big ifs, but if that were to happen, how do the rest of the sectors react who are being taxed? The insurers, the drug makers, would hospitals say you can't enforce those dish cuts until you hit certain metrics? I mean, is there sort of a cataclysmic effect if that happens? Is that political activity or market I just mar I just wonder if the markets really care about it. Some people suggest that perhaps the drug makers got concessions in the ACA negotiations. For example, nobody's negotiating Medicare drug prices, that this may not be that big of a deal for them. Is it that big of a deal for insurers if they continue to pay the taxes in the ACA because they're getting new customers? That, that's, I'm, I'm looking at, at how the segments of the markets might react or not. Well, if, if, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I was just from the insurer perspective, I mean, they, they would certainly, you know, use that in the, in the public relations campaign to restart, um, you know, some of the things they'd done previously to try to uh, Get rid of the tax. You know, the the issue that you constantly run into is that okay, you want to get rid of the tax. Where's the funding come from? Um, and yeah, you know, I think that's uh, given the size of what the uh, insurer tax amounts to. Um, I think that's the the biggest stumbling block is coming up with a uh, you know a reasonable plan for uh, you know, how you'd offset that lost revenue. So I, I don't think they'd uh, end up getting a, a ton of traction from that. 
But yeah, to your question, I, I think I think there'd be a lot of me too's um, if that if that were to come through. I mean, it's just hard to to think that you know other trade industries and lobby groups wouldn't be all over you know why them and and why not us essentially in terms of having to you know take something away that you know others have to continue to sort of pay for. Good. I've got a question about uh, Medicare Advantage. When I saw it, I realized, oh, I didn't put any questions in Medicare Advantage in. And if I'm understanding it right, um, I think the question is about, you know, just given the, you know, the Medicare cuts made so far and, uh, you know, scheduled to continue, uh, what's your sense about how that's going to affect growth of the sector over time? Uh, you know, should we expect continued growth in, say, the market share? percentage of Medicare beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage or, or not? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll start. I, I, yeah, I mean, I would I would expect enrollment to, to continue. I mean, Medic, MA penetration, I think, still in the 27, un, under 30 percent range. And, um, I, you know, I think, I think e even though there may not be public acknowledgement by the government, I think there's a, a greater um, acceptance that, you know, fee-for-service isn't working and the, the fee-for-service model isn't working. And I think there is a, a push and a want to move more lives onto, you know, private plans. Um, you know, so, so I'd expect enrollment to go up. You know, do I expect there to be, um, you know, funding cuts going forward? Yes. I mean, so there may be some level of breaking point where the enrollment potentially starts to slow. But, um, I, you know, I think as of right now, I think, you know, we, we've gone through some pretty hefty cuts. And enrollment's, uh, you know, been, been pretty healthy. And, and, you know, now that things are getting somewhat more benign, I don't know why that would uh, derail the, uh, the penetration rates within MA. Yeah, I mean, I just say for, for 2014, uh, at least from a growth perspective, there has been no perceptible impact on growth from the rate cuts. So 2014 was the single biggest year for Medicare rate cuts. Enrollment growth in 2014 actually accelerated um, you know, for the industry. So, uh, you know, there's been, been really no, no noticeable impact there. Uh, you know, as you think through sort of how that happened, um, you know, a couple factors to think about. So one is that Although the base rates were down 5% in 2014, uh, there's very few plans out there actually reporting a 5% reduction in reimbursement. Uh, the reason is they've been able to continue to significantly improve their risk scores and the risk adjustment payments that they get. Um, so, you know, the actual rate cut that the plans are seeing is more low single digit uh, as opposed to 5%. Uh, you know, second factor is the uh, employers are increasingly shifting more of their retirees into Medicare Advantage plans. So we had been getting sort of 200,000 lives a year uh, into plans. This year it was over 400,000. Um, and then the, uh, the third point is that you have actually seen some companies uh, sort of actually believe in the fact that they're saving money. Uh, so as an example, Humana this year, despite seeing the 5% rate cut, did not do very much in terms of changing their benefits. So typically, Medicare rates come down, plans adjust their benefits, they keep their margins stable. This year, Humana said, we think we can do a good enough job medically managing people and keeping them out of the hospital that despite the rate cut, we're not going to adjust our benefits. Uh, you know, and the result is they have uh, grown significantly this year and, and picked up share. And it seems like from a provider standpoint, I, we've seen where providers and, and some of the, the large national insurers have been able to come together on MA plans because they and, and work together from a savings standpoint. So it's on the provider side, there seems to be a lot of interest in, in expanding uh, MA and, and working with, with some of the insurers and in developing a, an MA plan. You know, both of those responses really were what I was going to, part of what I was going to ask about is a follow-up question, which is, uh, you know, your sense of whether the actual trends in, uh, you know, in spending, which, you know, is a function of, uh, external things, but also how care is being delivered. Whether managed care, whether Medicare Advantage is now at the point where it's actually having a lower trend than fee-for-service Medicare. Because if that's the case, then, you know, that's a way of withstanding the cuts. Yeah, no, I think the, I think the answer is, uh, you know, unquestionably yes, uh, in the sense that you know, if you go back a few years ago, Medicare Advantage plans were paid 15% more than fee-for-service. Uh, it's now down to about 6%. Um, so been some, some meaningful cuts to reimbursement. 
the extra benefits that the managed care companies offer to seniors is still relatively equivalent. So most plans will tell you that their benefits are 10% better than what you can get through fee for service uh, on average. You know, the margins in some cases have come down, but you know, for the industry as a whole, uh, you know, are, are you know, essentially the same. So you know, I think the answer is yes, they have, uh, you know, have done a better job with the, from a management perspective. Yeah. And we're almost out of time. And rather than going to another question, let me just ask the, or invite the panelists if there's anything else they would like to say, uh, say are the thoughts they've had from our conversation an issue that didn't come up uh, before, before I close the meeting? Yeah, I guess one, one thing that um, you know, we, we touched on a little bit was just around small group dumping um, and you know, sort of what the, what the trends will, uh, will look like there. Uh, so, you know, what we've seen um, this year is uh, WellPoint, as an example, has talked about their small group business falling about 15 percent, uh, you know, which they attribute to, uh, you know, to lots of small employers, uh, you know, dropping coverage. You know, I think that's a trend that we will see, uh, you know, continue into, um, you know, in, in, into 2015. Uh, you know, I would expect it actually probably will accelerate given that there were probably a number of small employers hesitant to uh, drop coverage last year with all the technology issues and, and healthcare.gov. I, I would just say that um, if, if we, from from very high level, if you look at last year, a lot of the worry was about, you know, how is this thing going to play out? Is the system going to be able to handle it? How is the health, you know, the, on the provider and the payer side, is it going to work? And there was a lot of worry about that. So far this year, it's kind of a let's sit back and just watch how this plays out. I think what we've seen thus far, and you know, we're only three quarters of the way through the year here. Um, well, a little bit further, but uh, in terms of reporting statistics, you're only three quarters of the way through the year. We don't really have that many data points still. So there's still, just because 2014 has looked pretty good so far, you know, there's a lot more to come and it's time is going to tell how the rest of health reform actually impacts uh, the delivery system. I guess the, the thing I would add, Paul, is, is, and I agree with you, we go to a lot of conferences and you hear the consultants and I think it's just human nature, you know, if it's sort of black or white and I think the change is going to be much more incremental than maybe a lot of what you read in the headlines. Uh, you know, whether it's private exchanges, whether it's providers, you know, moving in and disintermediating insurance companies. I think it's going to be much more incremental um, maybe than, than sort of what you expect and what you read in the consultancy reports. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we're, we're obviously in, in dynamic times in the history of, of healthcare right now. Um, and, and I think to, I made a couple of uh, references this earlier. I think there is some level of, of learning curve. Um, and so headlines can be uh, d distracting, um, I think, to the general sort of public. But when you, you sit back and you think about it, I mean, we wrote a report last year uh, where we estimated 6.5 million individuals had access to a zero premium plan. Now, obviously, there were deductibles tied to it, but those are big numbers. And I think that's, that's yet to be recognized by the broad-based uninsured um, and I think as outreach efforts continue to improve, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I continue to believe that, you know, the exchange enrollment will continue to grow. Because if you just sit there and you go on and you look at, you know, what, you know, sort of the ability to sort of uh, uh, capture sort of a achievable or um, affordable, I should say, uh, you know, health care, you know, I think the outlook's pretty positive for, you know, more uninsured gaining coverage. Yeah, well, I want to thank you that... Uh all of you. I think uh, each each of you four has been uh, terrific today, and uh, I think you've done a really good job. Um, I can I think a lot of the audience is very engaged in this. So I want to thank you for your participation. I want to thank uh, uh, I want to thank the JKTG Foundation for supporting this conference. Uh, I want to thank Alwyn Castle and Tad Lee my former colleagues from HSC who are working with me as, uh, as contractors to USC uh, for this conference. The Alliance for Health Reform provided the people downstairs. And uh, also, please fill out your yellow uh, evaluation form and drop it off uh, so we're adjourned.